A Bride for Harley, The Proxy Bride Series, Book 76, written by Heidi Gray McGill, narrated by Emma Fay. Prologue, September 1868, Montana. I would have preferred to choose my destiny rather than have it thrust upon me. Endless weeks of rail and wagon train travel have taken me from all I've known to the middle of nowhere, where nothing is familiar. Surely the home for children in Chicago would have been superior to the particles and smells that now fill my eyes and nostrils. Kerner's City can hardly be called a town. It's closer to a graveyard, though I hear the familiar strains of an out-of-tune piano and the calls of painted ladies as we amble through. I lift my now gray handkerchief to my nose. Filthy clothing hangs on living skeletons with eyes that watch us as we parade by. We must be the most interesting thing these emaciated gold miners and cowboys have seen today, or for some time. My skin crawls as the men's gazes land on me. The bench seat beneath me is as unstable as my breathing. Hota, the Sioux Indian our wagon master hired to keep us safe, moves his Appaloosa between me and the prying eyes. The horse's black spots blur on the animal's white-muscled form as he walks to a different cadence than the mules pulling our wagon. Loretta, you put on bonnet, Hota says to me. Cover hair. He does not look my direction, but after weeks of traveling under his watchful care, I obey immediately. Hota sees things, knows things I cannot understand. He is strong, both physically and mentally, as his name implies. Four months ago, I would have sneered at his order, but I've changed. I don't even recognize myself, and am not even sure who I am anymore. No eye contact, chin high. I sneak a glance, then mimic his stance. He rides high on his horse, literally and figuratively. He commands respect and obedience with few words. On our journey, he has saved many lives, except one. Chapter One, Chicago, 1867, Christmas Eve. I don't remember inviting Jack Frost to our holiday soiree, Annalise says in a sleepy voice. Some party, I reply. The dying embers of our fire provide little warmth, but enough light for me to see my breath. My sister and I share body heat under the heavy quilts weighing down on us. I hear her sigh, and know there is more than cotton pressing in on her. Good night, Loretta. Sleep tight. Don't let the bed bugs bite. She whispers what mother chanted every night like I am still a child. I refuse to respond and force my eyes to stay open. I'm afraid the tears may freeze my lids shut if I close them. Outside, I hear carols sung by brave souls sharing Christmas cheer and celebrating the birth of the Christ child. There is no joy or celebrating in our home. Soft tufts of air escape Annalise's nose. I envy her ability to sleep. My stomach growls and my teeth chatter thanks to her stingy ways. Father and mother left us this home and funds at their death, but my sister refuses to spend any of it and I'm not old enough to access the accounts. Being almost 17 is a curse. I'm no longer in school and no longer a child. I'm expected to act like a lady, but I'm nothing close to one and don't want to be. Annalise is the epitome of everything genteel and proper. Mother made certain of that. Thankfully, my father saw me as his favored son. The two of us spent many weekends at our one-room cabin on the lake where he taught me to swim, fish, hunt, and live off the land. No china or linen napkins, and the lake was our bath. Mother and Annalise rarely joined us at the shack, as Mother called it, but I loved it. It was my happy place. Happiness is long gone. I yearn for summer days paddling with our dog Daisy as she barked at nothing and everything before leaping into the water to seek whatever captured her attention. I ache for the feel of horse flesh and flying through the wind with my arms wide and my hair billowing behind me. 
roaring campfires, roasting corn, and cast iron skillet blackberry cobbler are all things of the past. I hate you, Nell, I whisper into the darkness. Annalise despises it when I use her childhood name. My outward mutiny to the captain of our sinking ship gives me a small sense of independence. She smothers me with her controlling nature. Nell, 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 I puff out the words. It's her fault we're in this predicament in the first place, and I'll not forget, nor will I ever forgive her. Merry Christmas, Loretta. Nell hands me a steaming mug of hot chocolate. A peppermint candy sticks out of the top. The offering melts a small piece of my frozen heart. Thank you. Merry Christmas to you, too. The warmth of the mug and the heat of the smooth liquid do wonders for my attitude. When you've finished and readied yourself for the day, I have a Christmas present for you. My elation of the moment quickly turns to dread when I realize I have nothing to give. I've spent the last months vacillating between anguish and anger, with a good dose of self-pity thrown in for good measure. I, I didn't get you anything, I stammer. You are my gift. I need nothing more. Besides, when you open your gift, you'll understand it as something for both of us. I rinse my empty mug in the cooling sink water and head out to do my chores. I should look forward to this holiday, but I do not. I'd rather spend time with our cow and chickens than with my sister. I love animals, but not the dreary weather of Chicago. It's not like we live near the heart of the city, but the smoke from factories and the trains that pass our home make the winter skies frequently smoky gray rather than crisp, clear blue, like I remember as a child. Good morning, Penelope, I say as I run my hand over the old cow's rump. The chickens fuss and cluck and I turn to quiet them. Wait your turn, breakfast. Penelope lows as I milk her. I snuggle into her warmth. She has an earthy smell I can't describe. Nell wants nothing to do with our animals. Getting her hands dirty is akin to committing a sin. Nell calls herself a planner, organizer, and creator of dreams. Ha, I say, causing Penelope to sidestep. Sorry, girl. Nell is more like a squasher of dreams. I laugh, and breakfast, dinner, and supper cackle along with me. You know your name that for a reason, right? I say to the chickens as they scatter. The lazy birds don't even provide eggs in winter. They're good for nothing but a meal. Stay warm, my friends. I shut the barn door when I finished my chores and return to the house. I slosh the milk on the counter when I plop the bucket down. My eyelashes feel frozen as I wipe my face with the back of my hand. I should probably wash them and the counter, but the feeling of rebellion growing inside me makes me leave both unclean. I'm tired of everything. Besides, I slept fitfully and woke grumpy. Even my sister's gift of cocoa can't completely change that. I avoid the stare I feel coming from Nell, who is in the rocking chair. That's when the smell overtakes my senses. Something smells good. Like Christmas, I murmur. Like mother. I reach for the oven door. Don't touch that. They have two more minutes. They? I made your favorite. Cinnamon rolls. Let's whip up some icing to put over them when they've cooled. She walks my direction. I blink back tears. Mother used to make them every Christmas morning in the same apron Nell is now wearing. I miss my parents. Nell has done her best to fill the void, but I didn't like her to start with, so having her in a parental role hasn't been the most pleasant experience. Nell points to the trail leading from the door. Loretta, you've tracked mud all over my clean kitchen floor. How many times do I need to remind you to remove your shoes? Rather than take off my footwear, I purposefully make new prints on my way back before slowly slipping out of their hold. I hear her sigh, but no words follow. She's probably repeated, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger multiple times by now. I turn to see her holding a mop out to me, lips tucked between her teeth, as if she's biting them to keep from letting out whatever she wants to say. Sometimes I wish she'd just say it, whatever it is. 
She keeps everything bottled up, acting like we have this perfect life and as if I'm not mature enough to handle whatever weighs her down. What? I ask, my voice coming out harsh and more condescending than I intended. I don't know what's wrong with me. I feel angry all the time, and Nell gets under my skin like dirt in my nails when I'm gardening. My heart is stained. Kindly clean up those muddy footprints while I pull out the cinnamon rolls, she says in the polite, controlled tone Mother would have used. That makes me madder, and I may have disobeyed if she hadn't reminded me of the treat. I wrench the stick from her hand. Water sloshes over my stockings. She could have told me it was already damp. Every back and forth movement primes the pump of my anger. Crash. I jump at the sound, the mop clinging to the floor, adding to the noise, then stop breathing at the screeching that follows a split second later. Chapter Two Nell! I yell and rush to her, taking care not to step on the broken baking dish on the floor. When I see her fingers, I rush out and scoop snow that is no longer white. She is still standing, unmoving, silent tears flowing down her face. I pack the snow around the blistering fingers, using my own to hold it in. My hands guide her to the kitchen chair, which I pull out with my now wet and dirty stockinged foot. Sit. I grab a towel, return outside and scoop more snow, then jump to break off icicles from the roof line above the door. When I return, the first scoop of snow has left a puddle on Mom's special occasion tablecloth. Nell is staring at the light brown stain. Don't worry about it, Nell, it will wash. My voice sounds irritated and frustrated, even though my sister is hurt. Nell's pinched features concern me. She's never been a beauty, but the red splotches on her pale skin aren't helping. Your rolls, she says. I'm sure I can salvage them. You stay put, I say, relishing the fact that I'm the one giving the orders. Mother's baking dish is in three pieces. The spatula does a good job of getting the caramelized sugar and fluffy pastry from the pan, but the floor may never be the same. Char marks peek out from underneath the dish as I lift it. I'm sorry, I hear her say, and it tugs at my heart. I soften my tone to match hers. They're still edible. You stay put and I'll get that icing made. My hand tires after moments of whipping, and I remember how much I dislike cooking. Nell and I may not be the best of friends or sisters, but we make decent roommates. Being the opposite of her refined ways is helpful now that there isn't a man in the house. My father passed those duties down to me, whether I wanted to inherit them or not. Please get the lime water liniment or linseed oil. That's another thing. I know nothing of medicine or anything related to it, and I may not be able to tell the difference between blueberries, huckleberries, and bilberries, but I can hit a deer who is snacking on them 15 yards away. I know, because I've done it. There are blessings to not having a brother. I return with the medicine bag. Fumbling through, I pull out bottles, so foul-smelling, even a cork can't hold the stench in. That's it, Nell says between gritted teeth. A slumped form replaces her perfect posture as I unwrap her hands. Small pieces of ice slide between her swollen and reddened fingers. White, leathery patches compete for space with blisters. When I apply the liniment, she flinches, but does not cry out. She may be prissy, but she's tough. I'm done, I say, not knowing what else to do. She doesn't respond, but I see her eyes blink and know she's still among the living. You should probably lie down. Christmas, is her breathy reply. It can wait, we've got all day. Wrap my hands first, please, she adds. I've seen enough in my brief life to know this is one time when the phrase cleanliness is next to godliness is the gospel truth. I cover the burn with a clean strip of fabric, wrapping it loosely to avoid putting pressure on her burned skin. She's probably more worried about getting the liniment on the quilt than protecting her hands. 
I tuck her in like she has done for me for as long as I can remember. I stare at her mousy brown hair surrounding her tear-streaked and splotchy face. Pain is etched in every wrinkle, even as she drifts off. At twenty, Nell already looks like she's lived a lifetime. My sister moans in her sleep as I immerse myself in the frigid seas of Moby Dick. The narwhal's whistle draws me in. The unique leopard seal-like creature leaps from the page and slaps the water as it returns. Page after page transports me to another place and time. A shriek causes me to fumble the book. I can only watch as it plummets to the depths. Loretta! Reality calls. Yes, I say as I walk to the bed. I'm a little perturbed at the interruption. Until I see her wrapped hands atop yellow stars on the quilt our mother made. I have no idea how long I have been at sea. Mrs. Winslow's, she chokes out. I find the blue-tinted bottle of Mrs. Winslow's soothing syrup. Nell must be in tremendous pain if she's resorting to an opioid. She won't even consider a hot toddy for a chest cold. I spoon a small amount and help her take it. Her shiver would be comical, except for the obvious discomfort it gives her. I'm sorry, she offers when she can speak. There's nothing to be sorry for. I'm reading and enjoying myself. I don't let her know I added more wood to the fire. It is Christmas Day, after all. Chapter 3 Chicago, New Year's Day, 1868 Feeling better this morning? I ask, taking care not to spill the milk on the counter, knowing I'll be the one to clean it up. I've had to take on more chores since Nell's accident. I believe so. You'd think after eight days my fingers would have healed. She draws her fingers in, but cannot yet make a fist. Cracked skin peels at the joints. Several places look dark and leathery. I'm not sure I'll ever do needlework again. That's a blessing from where I sit. I plop into the kitchen chair. Shoes, she points. I acquiesce and bite my tongue so yes, your majesty doesn't escape. Do I smell cinnamon? I sniff the air. Yes, and this time you're taking them out of the oven. My mouth waters. Cinnamon rolls. It is the first baking she's done since Christmas. Is it a special occasion? New Year's Day. Christmas came and went and you never opened your gift. Today seems more fitting anyway. A new start to a new year. 1868. There is no enthusiasm in my voice. I turn 17 in February, but beyond that, the drudgery of everyday life will not be any different in the new year. I just hope it isn't as tragic. Nell hands me the pot holders and I remove the sticky rolls, watching the bubbles and the caramelized sugar pop. Please come and sit, she says. Her hand hovers over the table, but her moving fingers don't touch it. I have something for you. She slides a postal envelope in front of me. For as secretive as she's been over the past months about the correspondence I've seen her read and write, I'm surprised she is finally sharing one with me. Open it, please. Her fingers graze her lower lip. Turning the envelope over, I lift the unsealed flap. Inside, I pull out two pieces of thick paper. Union Pacific Railroad. I don't understand. She doesn't answer. Her fingers can't use her favorite china teacup, but she still sips like a lady from a mug she holds with both hands. It covers the expression I can't quite read. Nell, I draw out. Annalise. Annalise. I exaggerate every syllable. Her back straightens, and she puts on her lady's function face. She's perfected the no-emotion look of boredom. I never understood that look. If you are bored, leave. Or better yet, don't go. But to sit intentionally with a bunch of women you don't enjoy talking to about topics you don't care for is ludicrous. The breath she takes in must pain her somewhere, because she winces. I prepare myself for the worst. 
Maybe she's sending me to finishing school or back east to live with some distant aunt. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter. At least I'll be out from underneath her thumb. I've accepted the proposal of a man in Montana. We leave in May. That I didn't expect. I want to yell, does he know what you look like? But I just stare. Now, before you say anything, it's already a done deal. What? Done, as in... I interrupt her, then let my words drag out. Done, as in we are officially married. When? We married on Christmas Eve. My head is shaking and my mouth is open, but no words come out. My mind is reeling with a million things to say, but they are stuck, unable to escape. Nell is speaking and I pull my head back into the conversation. We'll need to pack only what we absolutely must have. The rest of our items we will sell. Nell, Annalise, don't you need two people to get married? Of all the things I could ask, that made it out of my mouth. We married by proxy. When I stare like a deer who knows I'm there but isn't sure what to do, she continues. Reverend Peterson performed the ceremony and I signed the papers. Mr. Harrison did the same on his end. It's a legal transaction in Montana. She flicks her hand like this is normal. Transaction. On Christmas Eve, I say. Yes. By yourself? Technically, yes. Without a groom? Mr. Harrison is a respectable cattle rancher. You two are a perfect match. You love animals. Sass and sarcasm drip from my words. Loretta, please. My heart catches. She sounds just like Mother did when mad at me. She composes herself and schools her emotions. I know this is a shock, but you do not understand everything. I might if you'd share it with me. I am not a child. My sharp words hit their mark. Something flickers across her features. All right, I'll let you in on our situation at present. There is nothing here for us. We have no living relatives nearby. Father left us this home, but he did not pay it off. I have no marketable skill and cannot find appropriate work to pay our bills. The funds father left us are dwindling. Is that enough grown-up information for you? The air around me chills. Whether it is the lack of enough wood in the fireplace or her words, I do not know. That's what I suspected. As the eldest, it is my responsibility to ensure I provide for our needs. The senior Mr. Harrison was a friend of father. I found a letter when going through our records directing me to contact Mr. Harrison Sr. of the Double H Ranch in Montana if something should happen. Her words trail off. My emotions are not so easily swayed. And? I push. I did as Father and Mr. Harrison instructed me to do. Mr. Harrison arranged everything. Does his son know what he's getting into? She worries her lips, something she does only when contemplating a falsehood. Oh, my stars and garters, I exclaim. Loretta Maureen Fritter, you watch your language. Her eyes blaze, but it lights my short fuse. Let me get this straight, Nellie. You wrote to a man you do not know because you found correspondence from father saying you should. Then you accepted a proposal of marriage. Her eyes flicker again, and I let out a chortle. Oh, that's even better. You agree to a marriage without a proposal to a man you have never met. That's royal, Nellie. You are crazier than I thought. Did you give one thought to me? Tears form in her eyes. I've overstepped, but I don't care. I push the tickets across the table to her. If you wanted to get rid of me that badly, you should have let me go with mother and papa. My words are loud even to my ears. I grab my coat and run, letting the door slam behind me. Chapter 4 Union Pacific Railroad, June 1868 
I'd prefer being on the Pequod in the open seas to being in this second-class seat. At least there would be sprays of salty ocean water instead of sparks that fly into the window and singe my hat and dress. I'm contemplating abandoning ship when we reach Fort Laramie. I know how Moby Dick ends and don't want to chance the same fate. Fate. Nell says there is no such thing. Maybe God directs her path, but not mine. I'm drug along at the whim of everyone else's decisions. I feel like the toddler catty corner to where I sit. He must stay within the boundaries laid out for him, yet attempts escape when watchful eyes are no longer vigilant. I know how you feel, buddy, I say. So you do speak. Nell's haughty tone grates on me. I glare at her. Not to you, I say, my tone curt. My throat is scratchy with disuse. We have spoken only a handful of words a day to each other over the past months as we packed our home. Most of them were Nell's, giving me directions or correcting me, since it is impossible to live up to her expectations. I've kept to myself. I have Moby Dick nearly memorized. She's spoken with other ladies on the train during our three weeks of travels, but since we boarded this new train seven days ago, after changing for the umpteenth time, I've not said a single word to her. There is an art to communicating with nonverbal expressions. A single lifted eyebrow means something different from when both go up. The position of the head also says much. Nell's slightly cocked one with her chin thrust forward is not the same as my head, which is currently tilted at the same angle, but with my chin tucked in. Hers says snooty, while mine screams insolence. Next stop, Fort Laramie, Wyoming, the porter calls. The man attempts to make eye contact with each patron as he passes. His suit is neat and his white gloves amazingly clean. I envy him but not for his attire. He walks among those on the train seeking a new adventure while he sees something new every day without having to search for it. The porter knows his role. I'm stuck somewhere in between. I struggle not to find my role, but to play it. I've been the dutiful daughter, the son my father wanted, the caretaker of animals. My teachers labeled me their prize student, while my peers called me the odd girl. My mother deemed me uncouth and untamable. Now I've added the label of orphan. I use my hanky to wipe at the lower window, but the soot and debris are on the outside. My reflection is blurry, which is a mirror image of how I feel. July 1868, wagon train to Montana. If I thought the train was bad, riding on a wagon seat pulled by mules is worse. Today, I've chosen to walk. Mud covers the hem of my dress, hiding the frays and tears created by weeks of walking through brambles and stumbling over uneven ground. You want ride? Hota offers his hand from atop his horse. He is a frightening man, but I am not afraid. Loretta and I were about to discuss something, Nell says. I feel the tips of Nell's fingers on my elbow. I hadn't realized she was so close. Expressionless, he trots off on his magnificent animal. What in heaven's name do you think you are doing? Nell practically hisses through tight lips. We've had to resort to verbal communication on this leg of our journey. It is unfortunate, but imperative. I may be angry, but I'm not a dunce. Working as a team is the only way we will survive this trip. You have no business entertaining thoughts of that man, Nell says. I see no meal being served on china or silver. That's not the entertaining I mean, and you know it. What do you have against him? He's a human being like any other. He's a Sioux Indian and our protection. I shake my head, not understanding her. Her lower lip quivers. It is the first outward expression showing the toll this trip has taken on her. Having second thoughts? I ask. Not like you'd think. Mr. Harrison will make a fine husband. 
She pulls me a few paces away from the ears of those traveling with us. I heard a rumor that with all this rain we've had, crossing the Yellowstone River may be an issue. Aren't you the one always quoting some scripture about letting tomorrow worry about itself? You've been paying attention. She smiles like Mother used to. You're right. Thank you for the reminder. Our future is in God's hands. He has ordained our steps. But she worries her darkened and leathery fingers. You can't swim. I stop, causing her to stumble when she turns back to me. Her face is ashen. I shake my head and begin walking. She has to quicken her pace to catch up. Loretta, you know Mother never wanted me to go with you and Father to the lake. I had no opportunity to learn like you did. Mother never wanted? Right. You would have turned green the first time your feet touched the slimy lake bottom, and your screams the first time a fish nibbled your toes would have scared away all the wildlife. Nell's hands flatten against the loose bodice of her dress, and she blanches. I would have liked to have tried. Her whispered words do not align with my memories. You hated everything about that place. I loved father, she chokes out. I did not spend time with him like you did. We have stopped walking, and I stare at her in disbelief. Is that why you killed him? Jealousy? To get back at me because he liked me better than you? The slap that connects with my cheek shocks me. Slowly, I lift my burning eyes to meet wide ones full of tears. I hope you drown, I say, before stomping off. Chapter 5, August 1868, Wagon Train to Montana Waves pull me into their depths as I struggle to breathe. I sputter and flail my arms, trying to stay above the swells. Miss Loretta, Miss Loretta. I hear my name in the wind and reach out my hand, grasping at anything that will save me. I've battled Moby Dick all night long. He has won. My ship is sinking and I am left to die. Where is my sister? My arms connect with the fabric of the ship's sails, which threaten to pull me under with their weight. Nellie, I yell. Nellie! Someone is rocking me wiping wet hair from my face. Have they rescued me? I am freezing and my body shakes uncontrollably. Shh, shh, I hear, followed by soft humming. Nellie? Shh, child, you be just fine. It's over, it's all over. My body aches and I rub my tender arms. Dark brown ones encircle me. Maddie? Yes, ma'am, Miss Loretta, I right chair. You done bruised yourself up good this time, but no blood. I think them not terrors are lessening. Waves of nausea force me back down when I attempt to rise. I feel as if I've swallowed the ocean, but I believe it has consumed me. I'll bring you some coffee. The others be up soon. It's Saturday. Wagon Massa says two days of rest, so we rest. You stay right there and settle your things. I look around. The inside of our, my wagon looks like a tornado went through it. I suppose it did, and I'm the storm. The tempest raging in my heart and mind will destroy me and everything in my path if I allow it. By the time Maddie returns with a biscuit and coffee, I've righted the crates and folded the blankets into a place I can sit. The bitterness of the brew rouses my senses, and my mind clearly sees what I want to forget. She's gone. Nellie did not survive the crossing. She did not have the strength in her hands to hold on, and I did not have the fortitude to save her. Mr. Smith, an older man in our traveling party, blames himself since he drove our wagon across the river. But it wasn't his fault. If anyone is to blame, it is me. I willed this to happen. This is my punishment from God for what I said. Nell's pink hat box sits on top of the crates to my right. I've always been forbidden to peruse its contents. It has glared down at me and taunted me these past days. Or has it been weeks? I do not know how long she has been gone. Maddie watches out for me now, 
and Mr. Smith has taken on full care of our animals and driving our wagon. Although I have not seen him since I have only left my confines for personal necessity. I strain to reach the fabric-covered box and place it on my outstretched legs. Even though the camp stirs, the only sounds I hear are the gentle rub of the ribbon against itself as I untie and open the lid. I'm not sure what I expected, but not what lies before me. On top is a single baby booty, yellowed with age. On the side are the initials LMF, Loretta Maureen Fritter. The embroidery is rudimentary, and I look inside to see an uneven pattern and crude knots. This is nothing like Nell's stitch work, yet I know it is hers. Scattered throughout the contents are mother's pencil drawings and a smattering of photographs depicting me at various ages. Each has Nell's familiar curvy L where she has penned my name. We were probably ten and fourteen in the one now shaking in my grasp. Nell is holding a bundle, and I am looking at both with adoration. Walter, I whisper the name reverently. The bundle Nell holds was my baby brother, who lived only a few days. A feeling of sorrow and guilt creep up my spine. I blamed my sister for Walter's death, but I've always known it was not her fault. Papa said baby Walter went to sleep in mother's arms and woke up in Jesus's. I set the picture aside and peer into the box. The string wrapped around the leather-bound journal now at the top has loosened its hold. I fan the pages filled with pressed flowers, a tatted cross, and familiar script, before I stop near the end at a page dotted with splotches. Tears? January 1st, 1867. Today Loretta told me she hates me. She did not see my tears because she stomped off. Thankfully, she returned before dark, but not for my sake. She would never allow the animals to suffer at her hand. She is a troubled child. I think anyone who does not believe in a sovereign God must struggle with disappointment and loss. Her outburst this morning broke my heart in a new way. At fifteen, she should understand Mother's desire to celebrate her and Father's twenty-fifth wedding anniversary alone. Loretta is mad because she did not get to go, and Father placed her in my care. I believe she is jealous of the attention Father is giving Mother. I pray they are having a wonderful time in front of a cozy fire. One day I hope to be fortunate enough to have a romantic weekend away with my husband. I remember the day vividly. I thought Nell didn't understand me, but she obviously knew me better than I knew myself. The cabin was our spot, just me and Papa. Spoiled with his attentions and entitled, I did not want to share it with Mother. She would not appreciate the rustic adventure of the place. I should not be reading Nell's words. They are hers, but I am unable to tear my gaze from them. I turn the page. January 8th, 1867. Mother and father are gone. Five words. It is all she has written, yet I feel the pain in each one. I turn to the previous page and note the time passage. I do not remember the funeral or burial, nor does sleeping or walking fill my memories. A numbness that molted into anger, then eventually took flight is all I know. January 15th, 1867. Loretta believes me to have killed mother and father. There is no convincing her otherwise. I was not at the rains when the sled broke through the ice. Mother hated both the cold and the water. Nightmares plague me at what she suffered. But I must be strong for Loretta. She is my responsibility now. I slam the book shut. Even in death, my sister torments me. Miss Loretta? Maddie's sweet voice and bright eyes peek through the back. Miss Loretta? Today is the day the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. I scoff. We will rejoice and be glad in it, whether we feel like it or not. That be a command, she says. I can't tell if she means a command from God or from her, but I'm not about to cross either at the moment. Yes, ma'am. I untwist my skirts from my legs and climb to the edge. 
It takes me a moment to put on my shoes, but Maddie waits patiently. Come on now. One of the chillins find huckleberries this morning. The Lord done provided manna. It's our duty to gather what we need for today and tomorrow. She hands me a crude bucket while she carries a tightly woven basket with a handle. We walk in silence. I see several women from our group farther down the row of bushes, filling their own containers. Well, look at here. Mm, I do love me some huckleberry syrup on pancakes. You like pancakes, Miss Loretta? My mouth waters for the fluffy ones Papa made over our campfire. My mama used them like sweet bread. She'd take sausages and roll them up inside. Called them pigs in a blanket. She laughs. Funny what you remember. Her pause feels forced. I look her way, but she is studying the bush in front of us. What do you plan to do, Miss Loretta? I mean, when we reach the town where your sister's betrothed is to meet her wagon train. I have no plans. Never have. Decisions have always been made for me. I didn't intend to be left an orphan. I didn't want to come on this trip, the one Nell forced on me. I guess her perfectly laid out plans didn't pan out too well in the end. Miss Loretta, you take your time making your decision. Me and my man Zeke, we done discussed it, and you be welcome to continue traveling on with us. The sensation of needing to cry fills me, but no tears appear. I rub at my nose with the back of my already stained hand. Thank you. I have many things to consider, I say. Hota is beside me, and I startle. How much has he heard? Bear tracks. Pay attention at all times. He points to where a large animal print swallows up my small one. Then he is gone. He likes you, Maddie says matter-of-factly. He just feels protective of me. I'm a greater responsibility now that I'm alone. The words catch in my throat. Mm-hmm. February 10th, 1867. Mr. Johnson says he will give me three months to pay our debts, or the house reverts to the bank. I've already signed over the cabin to him. Loretta complained again today about the cold, but I cannot justify purchasing more wood. We will stretch what we have. I used our precious funds to send a telegram to Father's friend, Mr. Harrison. Bearing these burdens is only possible because of my Lord, but I am tired, and I miss Mother. I've read dozens of letters, reviewed Father's poorly kept ledgers, and devoured Nell's journal. I wonder if there are more packed away. Reading her beautiful script and hearing her voice in the words she penned is like meeting my sister for the first time. I've learned she knew she wasn't a beauty, which is why she worked so hard to shine in other areas. Her desire to please Mother was not because she loved all things feminine, but because of the praise Mother gave when she excelled. Nell liked Jimmy, the preacher's son, but he had not returned from the war. She wasn't jealous of my relationship with Papa. She simply desired more of his attention. Little details of Nell flood my senses, and I cling to them like Ishmael clung to Queequeg's coffin and Moby Dick to stay alive. Her memory is my life buoy. I finger the final stack of envelopes addressed to Annalise from Mr. Harrison Sr. Whereas reading her journal felt like seeing my life and how she viewed it, reading these letters feels like a sin. I have enough of those and do not need to add more. I place the memories back in their hold, place it on the crate above me, extinguish the candle, then scoot out from under the box's perusal into the starlit sky. Oh, I squeal. Strong hands steady my arms. The whites of Hota's eyes appear to glow in the dim light of the campfire's diminishing flame. In two weeks' time, we arrive in Kerner's city. What will you do? It isn't what he said, but how he said it. Full sentences. He reads my expression. I am not the dumb Indian you believe me to be. I feel his thumb move on my arm before he releases me and takes a step back. I don't think you are dumb, I whisper, my voice breathy and shaking. I do not know if it is this new revelation or the realization that I miss his touch. 
Except for Maddie, no one has intentionally touched me since Nell's death. I learn much by appearing only to be strong. It keeps everyone safer. His body does not move, but his eyes rove the camp on constant watch. To answer your question, I do not know, I say. You would make a good Sue. I expect his expression to change, but it does not. He is serious, and I know exactly what he is implying. You are in harmony with nature. Unlike other white women, you endure your suffering. He pauses, as if expecting a response to a question he has not asked. When we arrive, I will stay for you to meet your party. You can decide then. I will respect your decision. He evaporates into the night, and I would wonder if he was here at all, except for the tingling on my arms that may never go away. Chapter 6 September 1868, Montana March 22, 1867 Miss Fritter, God can use your situation for good. I know you may not see his hand at work, but my wife and I believe God has provided a solution that benefits us both. Our son, Harley, sustained injuries in the war. He has only lost the use of his left arm, but feels he will never be whole. He is restless and needs a good woman. You already feel like family since your father was my dearest friend. We will care for you as our own. It would honor us to call you our daughter. Please consider my proposition. Montana allows marriage by proxy. I have enclosed the necessary paperwork and funds for your travels and other expenses in hopes you will agree. Please leave no later than May to arrive before the first snow. Sincerely, Harley Harrison Sr. My hands shake as I unfold the paperwork holding my sister's signature. I trace the script, feeling the motion her fingers made with each stroke of the pen. She did not do this because she was in love. She did this out of necessity, to ensure we had a home. A single tear falls, and I wipe it from the paper, smearing the ink. She did this for me. In my entire life, I had never put Nell first. I see my selfishness and am ashamed. I've never considered the needs of anyone above my own. Until I read Nell's journal, I never fully realized her hopes of being a wife, mother, and homemaker. Now she will never see those dreams fulfilled. Time stands still, and my breaths come in quick, shallow bursts. Nell may not achieve her dreams, but I can fulfill them for her. It is the least I can do. You sure, Miss Loretta? Maddie asks, after releasing me from a hug like I've never experienced. I'll be fine. I'm sure Mr. Harrison will be along shortly. Then I'll be on my way to a fine life. To match the words, I force a smile on my face. Are you lucky that Indian's staying with you? Not safe, Zeke says as he scans the area. He pulls Maddie in close as if to protect her. I'll miss these friends. You all right? Maddie says. Zeke turns to her with an odd expression on his face. No, I can't read, but I'll get someone to read it to me, she says. She swats at his arm and hand something to me. This be our address. I got it memorized. Don't need no paper telling me where I'm going. I all right. I give her one more quick hug, then watch them fall into line at the rear of the wagon train, already moving on. Stay with your wagon, Hota says as he hands me a rifle. Use it if you have to, and you may need to. I'll return. I watch him head northeast at a trot to catch up to the wagon master. Had he not told the man of his decision to remain behind until Mr. Harrison arrives? No one bothers me. It's as if they do not have the energy to do more than stare. Their eyes are glassy, and I wonder if it is homemade gut rot I smell on the wind or boredom that has taken their minds. Familiar hoofbeats sound and Hota appears. 
My decision in the next moments will determine my fate for the rest of my life. There is a heavy breeze, and the dust roils like angry waves on the sea. I turn my face to where Hota is focusing his attention. In the distance, I see something, and Noah's ship has come to rescue me. The figure gets closer, as does Hota. Mrs. Harrison? This must be the father. His hair is gray with white patches above his ears. I have gone mute. I turn to Hota, but he stares at the man, his hand resting on the pistol at his thigh. When no one moves, I gather my skirts and make to step from the wagon. Hota gives me his hand before I even realize he has dismounted. His touch sends shivers up my spine, but this time it feels possessive. I step from the wagon and approach Mr. Harrison. Yes, I'm Annalise Fritter Harrison. It is a pleasure to make your acquaintance. In those few words, I seal my future. I would have preferred to choose my destiny rather than have it thrust upon me, but I have no choice. I have no dreams of my own, so I will live those of my sister. Writing to the Double H Ranch, Montana When did you begin your journey, Mrs. Harrison? Annalise, please, I say. May 15th. I was thankful for the train. I don't believe we could have endured the entire trip by wagon. We? The animals and I, I stammer, pointing to the empty chicken crates in the back. We started with three chickens, but they soon fell to the fate of their names. Breakfast, dinner, and supper. He laughs and writes himself giving the mules a light tap as we move up the slight incline. Keep your head, Loretta. No, Annalise. I must think of myself as Annalise from now on. Is your home far? The moon is not bright, but the sky is clear. Already I can see stars in the heavens. About another hour. It will be dark by the time we arrive, but it will give you an opportunity to see the Milky Way. I remember reading about it in books. Chicago's gas lamps and sooty skies snuffed out the stars. But at the lake, Papa and I would go to the dock on the shore and watch them for hours. My throat tightens. I am sorry for your loss. I didn't do a good job of keeping up with your father, but I missed his friendship. When he went to the big city and I headed west, we lost touch. I'm guessing it's been about 20 years. I'm thankful he had the forethought to have you contact me. His kind words nearly undo my resolve. I nod. I've spent four and a half months crossing the country, but I've not had a proper cry since my parents' death, and then Nell's. Anger does that to me. I'm afraid if I start, I won't be able to rein in my emotions. Your father always was an outdoorsman. It surprised me when he chose Chicago over the open lands of the West. You like the out-of-doors as well? From your letters, it seemed you preferred homemaking duties. I read the correspondence from Mr. Harrison Sr., but not what Nell replied. I do not know what she's told him. If I am to keep up this ruse, I will need to make my lies as close to the truth as possible. I suppose I said those things to make your son more willing to accept the terms of our agreement. When he does not respond, I continue. The truth is, I love the fresh air, the earth, and caring for the animals. Do you ride? Father taught me. It has been years. We sold our horses when... Realization dawns. Father likely sold the horses because we needed money. Yes, well, you'll have plenty of opportunities to ride on our ranch. How many acres do you have? if you don't mind my asking. Just over 2,000. We keep the cattle close most of the year, then let them graze the open land in the winter before we round them up come spring. Most amazing thing you've ever seen. Harley Jr. came up with that idea. While we struggle to stay warm, the animals thrive. Harley always led the round up to bring them back in close until the war. Mr. Harrison's lips tighten. I see his shoulders drop before he continues. 
Harley has taken on more of the management of the ranch. I might as well tell you this was not his first choice. I can't decide if by this he means being the ranch manager or getting married. Mr. Harrison sighs, then stiffens. I follow his gaze to a lone figure in the distance. Had the horse been white, I would have thought the man atop it to be Hota. The night air cools, and I wrap my arms around where I still feel his touch. Whoa, Mr. Harrison quietly calls to my mules as he pulls the reins. His movement is practiced and smooth. In one motion, he lifts and checks the rifle stored under the wagon seat. My heart races. I hear Hota's words in my mind and keep my chin high. Only I can't divert my gaze. The figure approaching pulls like a magnet. The Indian is as magnificent as his horse. Lakota, my friend. Mr. Harrison lifts his hand in greeting. Let me introduce Mrs. Annalise Harrison, my new daughter-in-law. My heart should calm at the realization Mr. Harrison knows this man, but it does not. Lakota never takes his eyes from mine. I should have a healthy fear of this man, but even though it is pounding, my heart feels safe in his presence. The wiry man's weather-worn and aged skin makes him more fierce-looking than Hota, but his eyes are kind. My eyes beg me to blink, and I comply. I came to see you home. There is talk of unsettledness in the area. Thank you, my friend. Lakota turns and leads the way. I am mesmerized by his horse, which is brown with patches of white in uneven shapes, as if painted by a child. The animal's creamy mane blows in the wind with each precise step. Rider and animal appear to be one. Mr. Harrison looks at me and taps the hands clenched in my lap. I guess I am more afraid than I want to admit. Or maybe it is the realization of the life I could have led had I chosen to go with Hota. I relax my hands. What's done is done. You're going to do just fine, young lady. Darkness creeps over the land. I draw in the crisp, clean air and marvel at the faint band of light that stretches from horizon to horizon. We follow the pale white glow. That's the Milky Way. Mr. Harrison points, but I do not need to follow his finger. My gaze is already fixed on the splendor. I've never seen anything like it. There is awe in my voice. I think God gives us a glimpse of himself in the beauty of his creation. I've looked up into those stars more nights than I can count. Each time God speaks to me. He doesn't speak to me. What does he say to you? My question sounds childish and rude. I'm sorry, that is none of my business. The look on his face makes me wonder if he knows my secret. There is question in his eyes. I straighten my back and return my gaze to the sight above me. It's not that he says anything. Most nights I'm telling him my cares. He already knows what's going on, but I figure he likes to hear my voice all the same. I have never considered this. I do not share my cares or problems with anyone. Does it help? I ask. Every time. Not always right away, but I know when he answers. Does it in his own timing, but he's never late in his response. Sounds of cattle lowing in the distance pull my gaze from the heavens. Welcome to the Double H Ranch. A one-and-one-half-story structure sits atop a knoll. Light flickers in one window like a beacon leading me safely into shore. That's our home. Those down there belong to our hands and their families. He points to the east. Six small dwellings constructed similar to our lake cabin, with gable roofs dot the area in a circular pattern. From this distance, and in the dim light of the moon, it appears each has a single door, but no window openings. The wood is notched log with white chinking reflecting the moon's glow and sparkling like the stars above. Mr. Harrison pulls the wagon to a stop. I turn, expecting Hota to be there to help me down, then realize my error. My eyes scan the area for the Indian who was with us moments before. 
If you're looking for Lakota, he left us when we reached Harrison Land. We live in what was once a Cinnaboyne Indian territory. They have since moved to Fort Buford in North Dakota. Lakota has remained and is our friend. Mr. Harrison puts two fingers in his mouth, and an impressive whistle rends the air. Dogs bark, and a light appears in the doorway of one home. Let's get you settled, my dear. The outhouse is this way. My body thanks him, though I make no mention of my gratitude. I'll gather your things. You can meet me on the front porch. The front porch swing squeaks when I reach it. I watch the men care for the mules and Mr. Harrison's horse tied to the back before they begin unloading the wagon. I pull a well-loved quilt from the side table and cover my shoulders. My hand reaches out and touches the thin strips of wood molding placed over the seams of panel boards on the house as I rock back and forth. My father called this board and batten, but I have only seen it on one building in Chicago. The effect is both rustic and elegant, with the strong vertical lines providing shadows and textures to the home's exterior in the dim moonlight. After months of movement, I would have thought my body would crave stillness, but the swing comforts me. My eyes close of their own volition, and I dream of the wood swing in our backyard in Chicago. Chapter 7 I wake in the early dawn to find I remain on the porch swing of my new home. Someone has covered me with additional quilts. Reminders of my papa and I camping under the stars soothe my soul. I close my eyes and listen to the surrounding sounds. A morning dove calls to me. coo 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 It is the song given by males trying to attract a mate. It sounds haunting and sad, as if the bird does not feel he deserves to be answered. Wing whistles break the mournful sound as several birds flit away. Something has disturbed them. I remain still. A smell I well remember fills my senses, and I open my eyes to see an immense muscular hound staring at me. He won't hurt you. I have no fear of dogs. It is the voice I hear that causes me to sit up much too quickly. My head spins, and my hand moves to my forehead, then over my hair, which must be a tangled mess. You look nothing like you described in your letters. He sounds disappointed, and I worry father's pet name for me was just that, a name, not a reality. I was always his beauty. I pull my stockinged feet up underneath the quilts, and the swing sways from the motion. Father didn't have the heart to move you last night. I hope you were comfortable, he says. Yes, very. His eyes are dark, in color and intensity. They bore deep into me, as if they can pull answers from the marrow of my bone. The dog saunters off, satisfied, or at least not seeing me as a threat, as it appears this man does. Why did you agree to this, really? It is then I see the open letters in his lap, with Nell's familiar cursive. How long has he been sitting in that chair, watching me? You tell me. What do my letters say? Without looking at them, he responds. Your parents drowned. Your father did not manage his affairs well and left you without funds to maintain a respectable lifestyle. So you reached out to my father, who offered my hand in marriage as a solution to solve both our problems. That pretty much sums it up. But what are his problems? It is then I notice his left arm hangs limp at his side. What I want to know, that you obviously did not include in these letters, is why you are here. The emphasis on you makes my stomach churn. Does he know my secret? I cannot speak, but I don't need to. He continues as if having a conversation with himself. You are not what I need or desire, yet you are here and we are married. His sigh is deep and long. I want to come clean, to release him from the agreement that is likely not even binding since I'm not Annalise. But I cannot get words past my trembling lips. I reach up and touch them. They are wet, as is my face. 
Good morning, Annalise. I trust you. Mr. Harrison sees me and turns to his son. Well done, Harley. How long did it take for you to make her cry? Mr. Harrison's words hold resignation, and a sigh much like the one his son produced moments before follows. Well, my dear, I'll have a word with my son. He points to my shoes under the swing, and I put them on and rush to the outhouse. When I return, Mr. Harrison pats the empty place beside him on the swing. The other Mr. Harrison is gone. I'm sorry about the welcoming party. Harriet has breakfast ready. Are you hungry? Does everyone's name start with an H? His laugh is jovial and contagious. My tears are forgotten. She almost didn't marry me because of my last name. But who can say no to a face like this? He winks, then offers me his aging hand. The scents of lemon oil, bacon, and cinnamon greet me as we walk inside. I notice Mr. Harrison remove his shoes at the door, so I do the same. The sawn wood floor is as smooth as glass, and I imagine running and sliding across it. There is a formal parlor to my left, and possibly a study or library to my right. Past the stairs leading up, the hallway opens into a large, inviting area, warmed by a crackling fire in a floor-to-ceiling stone hearth. Flour and utensils cover a butcher block in the center of the kitchen. I follow a trail of white to a buxom woman covered in the powder. Behind her, the younger Harley is at the table with a mug in his good hand. Annalise, welcome. She opens her arms and pulls me into a hug that reminds me of Maddie. Unable to control my emotions, I burst into tears and bury myself in her embrace. I must not have finished my crying from earlier. Harley Harrison, what have you done to this girl? Come, dear, let's get you a cup of coffee. Shoo, both of you, you can eat later. I feel her hand motioning the men out, then hear the scrape of wood on wood. After several moments, she peels me from her. The apron is now gooey, and we both chuckle at my brown traveling dress with a huge white spot across the front. Sit down, sweet girl. The warmth from the chair Harley vacated seeps through my wrinkled skirts. I feel a blush creeping up my neck, and know the added color won't improve my tear-stained face. First you eat, then we'll take care of your things. You brought enough for two. Panic makes it impossible for me to swallow the coffee set before me. Nell and I are not the same size. I am a few inches taller, and my body never grew the curves she wore so well. No need to help, Mrs. Harrison. You have your hands full. I can manage on my own. Full? Dearie, those two overgrown boys of mine can manage on their own. I didn't get to do this with my daughter, who was taken from this world as a child. But God gave me you, and I plan on making up for lost time. Now, about this Mrs. Harrison business, I'd be pleased if you'd call me Harriet, or Mother. Thank you, Harriet, I eke out. She sets a plate with eggs, bacon, and a flaky pastry before me. German sweet braided nut bread. My mother taught me to make it. She cuts hers in half and shows me the center. It reminds me of a pinwheel with the cinnamon swirled throughout. I take a bite and moan. The dimple in her plump cheek shows her pleasure at my reaction. I have no trouble finishing my plate, and am a little embarrassed. Mother would have chastised me and reminded me a lady should not wolf down her food like a rabid animal. Comfort food, she says, and picks up her empty plate along with mine. My mother always seemed to know exactly what to make to cure whatever ailed me. I made this today because it is what my mother made the morning I married Mr. Harrison. I thought I would carry on the tradition. Confusion clouds my mind. Technically, you are already married, but there is no reason you and I can't make the day special. Your new husband will take care of making tonight memorable. All the air leaves the room. Since mother gave up long ago on preparing me to be a proper woman, she did not discuss things of a personal nature. 
Nell explained my monthly, but no more. Oh, my dear, that's not what I meant. She pats my shaking hands. We are having a celebration tonight. Harley has planned it. They started roasting the pig last night, which could have led to his grumpiness this morning. He didn't have much, if any, sleep. You'll meet all the hands and their families at the celebration. I hope you brought comfortable shoes. It wouldn't surprise me if the men keep you dancing all night. That is if Harley will let you out of his sight. She stands and refills my milk. My, but you are a pretty little thing. And young. Your letter said you turned 21 in August, but you don't look a day over 18. You'll need to keep a bonnet on your head if you want to maintain that creamy complexion and keep freckles off the pert little nose of yours. It may be cold out there, but that sun is strong, even this time of year. Her words all run together, and I wonder if I missed it or if she ever took a breath. I finish my milk. Days a-wasting. Her plump fingers struggle with the apron strings tied behind her back, so I assist her. I hear the door open and do not want to see Harley, so try to hurry. I fumble but manage to untie the knot she's created. A woman with coffee-colored skin and dark wavy hair that flows around flawless skin joins us. She is petite but not fragile. There is a strength in her that radiates. Her brown eyes go wide when she sees me. Senora Harrison, welcome. She reaches up and touches my cheek and I instinctively lean into her motherly gesture. Oh, so beautiful. Her mouth makes a tisk-tisk sound. It is good you are already married, or we would be fighting off the vaqueros, no? Maria, this is Annalise. It is a pleasure, senora. Let us help you clean this mess before we head up to take care of Annalise's things, Harriet says. You go, I clean this up. She pulls an apron from a peg on the wall. Thank you, Maria. Que leo, what a mess, she mutters under her breath as we walk away. Maria, please let the men know they can come in now. I banished them from the kitchen earlier. Si, senora. I heard them complaining when I arrived. Come now, Annalise. The men moved your things into Harley's room. Another reason he didn't sleep last night. The bed was covered. She laughs, and her breathing becomes labored once we reach the top of the stairs. Ugh, I think we added a few stairs. All this huffing and puffing makes me feel old. I grab the railing when I reach the landing at the top. I can see over the edge and into the eating and living areas. The stone fireplace along the back wall warms the air with its burning logs. Mr. Harrison and I are to the left. She points. Your and Harley's room is here. I follow her to the opposite side of the stairs and into what would be a decent-sized room, except for all the crates taking up space. A single window offers light, and I'm drawn to it. This room is directly above the office. I hear the swing creak under the porch roof jutting out below. Beautiful, isn't it? Harriet's words are breathy, but not from lack of oxygen. The view is spectacular. Yes, I feel like I can see forever. Mr. Harrison built this home for me high up on a knoll for that very reason. I love waking every morning and looking out my window, even before my feet hit the floor. Well, we best get a move on. The crates labeled kitchen and housewares are in the barn. If you need something out of them, you can get it later. For now, let's focus on figuring out how to fit all these items in the wardrobe and dresser drawers. Would you mind helping with this one? I hand her my carpet bag and step in front of Annalise's. I'm not sure why I packed duplicates. I force a giggle. She smiles as if I've offered her my friendship along with the tapestry bag she is already unpacking. My, your clothing will need a good scrubbing. Wagon travel will do that. Oh, look at this lovely silver hairbrush. All the items remind her of something. Her youth, Harley as a child, her first years of marriage. She shares every story with fondness. We have emptied all but Nell's party dresses and traveling bag. Mrs. I mean, Harriet, would you mind if we take a break? I'm parched. 
That's a fine idea. I'm getting a bit peckish myself, and my feet could use a rest. Let's see what Maria has been up to. I'm hoping she made buñuelos. I follow her swollen ankles down the stairs and pray to a god I'm not sure hears me that she won't have the energy to help me finish the unpacking. Chapter 8 Hot coffee and something sweet and golden brown await us. Harriet allows Maria to dote on us as we sit at the table and chat. The fried treat is light and airy and has a crunch to it that sends the cinnamon on top to the dish below with each bite. Anise seed and dried orange peel. Pardon me? I ask. This is not the traditional recipe for buñuelos. Maria created this one. Harriet licks her finger, then uses it to pick up the flaky crumbs from her plate before sticking the covered finger in her mouth. Mother would have slapped my hand for such an action. Harriet rests against the back of her chair and finishes the milk with a splash of coffee in her cup. This woman is not blood, yet I feel a motherly connection with her I never felt with my mother. Senora Harrison! Maria looks back and forth between us as she clears our plates. Ijole, two Senora Harrisons! Maria, please call me Annalise. No need for formalities with me. Her smile reminds me of the Milky Way. Si, sí, gracias, Annalise, she says, and gives a slight bow. Her expression changes when she turns to Harriet. You, senora, will take a siesta. She directs Harriet like she would a small child. I'm amazed Harriet complies. Her eyes are closed within seconds of lying down on the horsehair sofa. I'm going to finish my room, I whisper to Maria, who nods in understanding. I must get Nell's things put away before anyone sees them. I tiptoe across the floor and up the stairs. In the crate with her Sunday and special occasion dresses are white cotton pantaloons, two chemises, a winter nightgown with long sleeves and high neck, and a lacy summer nightgown with capped sleeves. Heat fills my core, and butterflies compete for space in my stomach. I hear a knock on my door and put the frilly nighty in my hands behind my back. Yes? Senora Harrison, Annalise, this is my daughter, Isabel. She can help you with whatever you need. The woman is gone before I can speak. Isabel stares at me with her mother's chocolate eyes. If I thought Maria was beautiful, Isabel is stunning. A high ponytail sways in rhythm with her hips as she walks to me. She is young but already more of a woman than I. Hello, she says. It is not a timid sound. She spies the lace behind my back and reaches behind me and grabs it. Oh, this is so lovely. Will you wear it tonight? Heat surges at my neck and I reach for the item, but she puts it up against her dress bodice and twirls. Oh, how I wish for such things to include a man as handsome as yours. She thrusts the item back at me and moves onto Annalise's favorite party dress, lying atop the bed. The indigo blue is beautiful against her dark skin as she stares at herself in the corner mirror. Her tanned skin glows as she turns this way and that. She puts one foot forward. This is much too short for you. She pulls the bodice across her blossoming figure and peers at me through the looking glass. You must have lost a great deal of weight on your travels. This certainly won't fit now. Oh, how nice to have such things to choose from. She tosses the indigo dress in a rumpled heap on the bed and picks up an emerald green one. Isabel is bold, but I see myself in her. My former self. How many times did I do something similar? But maybe this could be a solution. The dress does look lovely on Isabel and it is a good way to free up the space I do not have for these items I will never wear. You know, that dress never fit me well. In fact, I have a few others. Maybe you should have them. Her movement to face me is so quick, the end of her ponytail wraps around her slim neck. Oh no, mi madre would never. Her voice trails off. Maybe this one, for tonight, the celebration. Yes, the celebration. Please, it is a gift from me. Your mother can't refuse that. 
try it on. I already know she is not timid, but she is also not shy. She slips out of her day dress and pulls Nels over her head. I button the back for her as she holds the ends of her hair out of the way. The gasp that escapes me causes her expression to change, from elation to concern. I should not take this. No, no, Isabel, please. Your beauty overcame me. Really? I nod. It is true. But my actual struggle is knowing that Nell should be the one in that dress tonight. Isabel preens in front of the mirror. Her hands smooth the wrinkles, accentuating her figure. Girls? I hear Maria's call from below. Finish up quickly, Isabel. Take Annalise for a quick walk around the property. Then to the bathing house. It is nearly time to get ready for the festivities. Yes, Mama. I quickly unbutton her, and we giggle like school girlfriends as we shove things into places they do not fit. Four of Nell's dresses remain spread out on the bed. What will you wear? She runs her fingers over my dresses in the wardrobe. I'm not certain. I'll figure that out later. What I'm most interested in at the moment is the bathhouse. I haven't had a good hair washing in months. Let's just hope none of the vaqueros speak in. She lifts and lowers her eyebrows, then winks. My shock keeps me from responding, but I wouldn't have had time anyway. Come on, she says on her way out the door. I run after her down the steps and grab my shoes. She already has hers on and waits at the top step of the porch. The beauty of Montana frames her. I cannot tell what is more spectacular. A dog's bark pulls me from the vision. That is Hollister, she says as I put on my shoes. She points to the hound I met earlier this morning. He comes toward us as we walk. It is almost like he is hurting us, since he keeps bumping into me, not allowing me to veer off his chosen path. His shoulder brushes against my fingers, and I scratch him behind the ears. Another H name. What kind of dog is he? Irish wolfhound. He is older now and spends more time with the family than working the cattle like his offspring. Stick a bow tie on him and he'd be quite the distinguished Chicago gentleman. A low grumble emanates from Hollister. We laugh and Isabel links her arm into mine. Come on, I want to show you my favorite spot. Someday I hope to build a house and raise a family there. Isabel looks like a mermaid. She has chosen the emerald green dress, and it flares out at the bottom. The cream-colored lace at the ends of the fitted sleeves are in sharp contrast to her dark skin. Her now dry hair falls softly around her face in waves. The color is dark like a turbulent sea, yet it shines like a windless one, glassy with gentle swells. Mine has increased in volume and refuses to be tamed. Seat. Isabel points to the small chair she pulls from the corner and places in front of the mirror. My pale yellow cotton dress is dull compared to Nell's that Isabel is wearing. Neither dress is especially fashionable. Before we left Chicago, Nell reworked several of Mother's dresses for me, since I had nothing presentable for just such an occasion. I feel dowdy with my uncomfortably high neckline. Had I not ruined my graduation dress, I would have had something nicer to wear. My cares dwindle away as Isabel brushes my hair. I close my eyes and remember Nell doing the same when I was a child. By the time my sister would finish, my pigtails would be uneven and the first ribbon already untied from all my moving around. Tears threaten and I dig my now clean fingernails into my palms. There, it turned out better than I expected, Isabel says. I open my eyes but do not recognize the woman in the mirror. The part is down the middle of my hair, which is pulled back from my face with tortoise shell combs. My hand touches the long ends trailing down my back. Wisps of hair fall over my ears, curving to frame my face. Isabel takes strands from the back and moves them up and over my shoulders. There, that helps break up the dull front of that dress. Does she not realize her words are hurtful? Her face shows no animosity as she moves different amounts of hair back and forth, as if trying to determine the exact amount to leave forward. More likely than not, I'm being sensitive. I reach up and touch the hand on my shoulder. Thank you. 
He looks lovely. She doesn't respond with words, only runs her fingers against her own hair. If it is beauty Harley wanted, why didn't he marry this girl? Chapter 9 Thank you all for coming tonight and helping us welcome our new daughter-in-law, Annalise, to the family. We'll start with dancing, then food, Mr. Harrison says. Mr. Harrison reaches his hand out to me. My own shakes as I stand from the overturned crate labeled Loretta. I'd covered the name with my skirt earlier, but now it sits, glaring at me. I focus on the smiles of the ranch workers and their families looking at me. Crates, barrels, and a variety of chairs encircle a flat area. Mr. Harrison squeezes my hand, and I paste on a smile as I face my new pseudo-family. God has blessed us with this young woman. Welcome to the family, dear. When I look into Mr. Harrison's face, I feel warmth and acceptance. I believe everything is going to work out, until I see the storm that is brewing behind the eyes of the man standing on Mr. Harrison's opposite side. Harley reminds me of Moby Dick, angry and ready to attack. I'm not sure I'm up for the battle. A special thank you to our musicians this evening. Mr. Harrison turns toward me and looks behind him, pulling me with him and allowing me to see the band. A wiry man holding a fiddle cannot seem to stand still. An older gentleman with a guitar offers me a kind smile. A man with hair sticking straight up on ends holds what looks like a fife that may have seen action in the war. It is poised and ready to sound the alarm. A young boy with a drum smiles at me, bobbing his head as if the music is already playing in his mind. I nod to the men before turning back around. Mr. Harrison raises his free hand, and the crowd quiets. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you on this fine evening you have created. We thank you for these two individuals and ask that you be the foundation they build their life upon. Please bless their union with companionship, love, and many children. I feel a knot forming in the pit of my stomach. I hear snickers and a cough from the mass of bowed heads. We also pray for this food and the hands that have prepared it. May you bless it to our bodies and us to thy service, and to give us the energy we need to celebrate. Amen. Murmurs of amen ripple across the crowd as men replace their hats and women dab at their eyes. Let the dancing begin. Mr. Harrison's loud voice and a few hoots from the crowd make me jump. He pulls at my arm and places it in his son's right hand. I cannot breathe, and my body quivers like I am cold. It is only appropriate you have the first dance, son, but I get the second. Harley's skin is hot. His rough hand is holding mine with more force than needed to pull me to the dirt dance floor. I feel like a rag doll, unable to control my own actions, which doesn't matter since Harley is making them for me. He places my hand on his shoulder, then grabs my other and puts it at his waist. I feel more than see him tuck the fingers of his limp arm into his pocket. I cannot tear my gaze from his face. As if he shaved earlier in the day, stubble covers Harley's square jaw. I long to reach up and touch it. Father was always clean-shaven, with a round baby face, which did not match his rugged outdoor hobbies, but was perfect for his job as a salesman. His boss once told him he had a face anyone could trust. Not so with the man in front of me. The need to breathe is real, and I am afraid I may faint, until Harley uses his now free hand to pull me tight to his waist. The force causes me to gasp. His eyes widen, as if he is as surprised by the intensity of the moment as I. I assume you can dance? His whisper is like a butterfly's wing against my cheek. He is only a few inches taller than me, putting our faces much too close together. I can only respond with a single nod. Wild and haphazard music matches our beginning steps until both the music and our feet align. 
There is no formal pageantry, no need for the coquettish glances I remember Mother explaining to Nell. This dance is raw. I am aware of music playing and recognize the sound of footfalls and laughter, but the only tune I hear is the melody playing in my heart. Unlike the lively music surrounding me, I dance to a waltz I do not know, reeled by a man equally unfamiliar. We flow as one, as if made for this moment. Then he stops, as does my heart, and the dream forming in my mind telling me this could work. I could fall in love with this man. My dress continues to sway, and he waits a moment before unfurling from its entrapment and taking a step back. My arms drop and hang like his limp one. My father. He starts, then clears his throat. My father would like the next dance, he says in a low voice. His curt words sting, but it is his look conveying his disgust with me that makes tears well up in my eyes. I watch the retreating form, and my heart aches. May I have this dance? I do not know how long Mr. Harrison has been standing there, but I force a smile and wipe the handkerchief Harriet gifted me across my face and eyes. I will not cry. You make a striking couple, Mr. Harrison says. Thank you. I'm not certain he would agree. I tilt my head in the direction Harley has gone. My dear, that boy is smitten already. He just doesn't know what to do with his feelings. The wink I receive when I look into his eyes for reassurance that his words are true helps settle my rising concerns. He has a difficult time getting close to anything, man or beast. I rethink asking a question when I see a sheen in the man's eyes that he does not attempt to hide. I guess I am a little old for all this fast-paced music. What do you say we grab a cup of punch and take a walk? I'd like to show you something. Mr. Harrison nods at his workers as we pass by. He pours my punch and hands it to me. I swirl the white liquid. Orchata. Maria makes it from rice and cinnamon, I believe. He takes a swig. One of my favorites. His sigh validates his words. It is good. Lightly sweet with a hint of vanilla. He offers his arm and we walk a distance away from the homes and festivities. It seems odd that he would take me away when I am clearly the guest of honor, but no one seems to care as they watch us retreat. Or they all know something I do not. Mr. Harrison, your son gave me the impression I am not what he expected or wanted. I feel heat rising up my neck and take another sip, hoping to cool the apprehension I have felt since first meeting Harley. Well now, I suppose there is some truth in that. I hear him breathing harder, whether from the exertion or the cooling temperatures, I do not know. We stop beneath a copse of trees. One tree is larger than the others. Its stunning yellow triangular-shaped leaves remind me it is fall, not winter, though the chill in the air over my damp skin feels icy. My gaze moves up the smooth, cream-colored bark of the long, narrow trunk, a soft, pleasant sound comes from the leaves as they move in the breeze. Quaking Aspen. Mr. Harrison's voice cracks when he says the words. Did you know these trees grow up to two feet per year? His hand moves over the area where trees of all heights sway in the breeze. I follow his gaze up into the oval-shaped canopy. This tree must be twenty years old or more. Quaking aspens are one of the first trees to regenerate after a fire. He clears his throat and wipes his eyes. When he opens them, I see an ocean of swirling pain in their depths. Our daughter Helen was three. Harley was seven. They were playing in the barn and... His voice trails off. Harley knocked over the oil lamp. He told Helen to come get us. He worked to get the animals out. Only Helen never left the barn. We found her hidden behind some equipment. Harley has never forgiven himself. His near silent weeping makes his words difficult to decipher, but I do not ask for clarification. 
We buried her here with our other four children. All boys, he says after several moments. He points to several markers I did not notice earlier. I wrap my hand in his like I did as a small child with my father and feel him shaking, but the touch seems to strengthen him. We lost our crops and our barn, but the cattle on the other side of the creek to the north survived, as did our home and us. We survived. Harriet refused to leave her children behind, so we stayed. We stayed, and we started over. You are both amazing people, I say. Like you, we did what we had to do. This time he lowers his head, and his piercing eyes look right through me. My ears clog like they do when I hold my breath underwater. The surrounding beauty loses its color. He helps me to the ground, takes my cup and pats my back as I pull my knees up under the hem of my dress and drop my head. Several moments pass. I pray he thinks my spell is from exhaustion, stress, or lack of food. Young lady, I'm not sure what all you've endured, but I hope you will learn to trust us. He pats my shoulder and I lift my head. He has shared something deeply personal tonight. Will I ever be able to do the same with him or anyone else? Chapter 10 Where is that handsome husband of yours? Isabel's voice is louder than the music. He is tending the pig, I answer, but do not see him with the other men. Keep an eye on that one or someone might steal him away. One side of her perfectly shaped lips tips up, and she turns toward the house. Harley crosses the threshold and disappears behind the door. She has known his whereabouts all along. Her words no longer feel like friendly banter. Will you please excuse me, I say, already walking toward the house. My steps slow as I near. What am I thinking? I don't even know what I am doing or what I will say when I see him. I open the door and remove my shoes, placing them next to his. Mine are small in comparison. I pat across the floor and hear before I see Harley opening and banging closed drawers. He startles when he sees me. Then darkness clouds his features. What are you doing here? He goes back to his search, this time jerking open and slamming shut cabinet doors. I will not let this man bully me even if it means getting into a scuffle and ruining this dress as well. I'm beginning to think you are a dunce. You've asked that question before, I say. I didn't get a satisfactory answer. He stops, the last cabinet door popping back open when he uses more force than necessary to close it. I do not flinch. He is a deer in my sights. Since it appears you have none to give, would you mind helping me find the two-pronged fork? he asks. My fluid movements seem to unnerve him, and he takes a small step back when I approach. My gaze never leaves his as I reach over the sink where the fork and large knives hang. I point the tips of the harpoon in my hand toward him, then lower it, offering the handle. His expression has not changed, but his eyes have. They lure me in like the spray of whale spouts in the distance, offering hopes of seeing something spectacular from the ocean's depths. Thank you. He takes the fork with a gentleness I have not yet experienced from him. My eyes flutter and my breath catches as his fingers whisper to mine. In case you were wondering, I'll be sleeping down here. It takes a moment for me to process his words. Thank you for that courtesy, I say. Appearances are all that matter. Speaking of which, he offers his right arm to me, and I take it without thinking. We are married. We should return to the party together. For appearances, I say. He releases me so we can both slide into our shoes. He opens the door, then ushers me out to the porch before shutting the door and once again offering his arm. There you are, Harriet beams as she greets us at the bottom of the steps. I was wondering if you'd forego the wedding feast and go straight to the honeymoon. The temperature outside has warmed drastically. 
that or I am hot enough from the words to change the seasons. Harley hands his mother the fork, causing my arm to move forward with the motion. I uncurl my fingers to let go, but he tucks his arm into his side, trapping my hand to his ribs. That is exactly what I came to get. You two beat me to it. Dinner is ready. Harley, your father expects you to say a few words. Yes, mother. I feel his ribs expand quickly, then retract slowly, as does the breath escaping between his tight lips. We walk in silence into a smoky haze. The wind has shifted. Smells of roasted meat and spicy sauces make my stomach growl. I hear Harley chuckle. Are you laughing at me? It seems you are not all you claim to be, he says. My stomach is no longer hungry. I would have thought a refined woman such as yourself would have complete control over such noises. Or so I gathered from your letters. He pulls me to a stop, the motion so forceful I stumble against him. My hand connects with his shirt and the well-muscled form underneath. Fire burns through my palm, and I think of Nell and her scorched fingers. You do not have to stay. Here. With me. He releases my hand from his arm and takes a step back, as if repulsed. My heart dives deep into the sea, only to surface moments later. Or is it he fears I am repulsed by him? Could his dislike of me stem from something I do not understand? We can annul our marriage. My father will send you wherever you care to go and provide for your needs. Is he trying to get rid of me? Isabel's words return and I plummet back into the depths. Isabel? I choke on the word as if I'm drowning. Excuse me? Isabel, would you prefer to be married to her instead? <laughs> the word is deep and breathy. That brown-headed cowbird has no desire to build a nest. She is only interested in placing her young in mine, then conquering the next unsuspecting male. Watch that one, Annalise. She is a parasite. I know of this bird and its conniving ways, but cannot connect what I know of Isabel with his words. She would never intentionally seek to steal Harley from me. Would she? He isn't even mine, technically. Once we cut that cake, there is no turning back. Can you live with this? His hand makes a sweeping gesture to the arm that hangs limp at his side. I want to scream that his arm is nothing compared to the wounds I carry. He startles when I touch the hand of his limp arm. I need the connection, but did not expect the tingling sensation that courses through me. He responds with a mild squeeze. I had hoped to feel safe in the harbor, but I believe my action is fatal. My ship has run aground, and I fear I have not only harmed my vessel, but everything in its wake. Chapter 11 As my father said earlier, thank you all for coming and supporting us on this special occasion. I know you're hungry, so I'll keep my comments short. Harley says to the assembled group, Hey, men! Someone from the back yells. Laughter ripples through the group. You already taste-tested every part of that hog, Marty. Seeing this jovial side of Harley surprises me. I didn't expect his good-natured ribbing with the man, but I'm pleased to know he has a sense of humor. The crowd quiets their laughter, and I look to Harley, wondering if I have missed something. He has turned to face me, and the intense look in his eyes confuses me. This does not feel like appearances. This feels like something much more real. Annalise Marie Fritter Harrison. You are a rare woman to marry a man you have never met, travel across the country to a land you have never experienced, to accept us as family when you do not yet know us. Your sense of adventure will serve you well. At some point, he has taken my left hand in his right. He slips a gold band with sparkling blue stones past my first knuckle. Engraved in the sides are what look like ocean swells, lifting the gem up from the depths. I look from the ring to the man placing it on my finger. The sapphire is a symbol of truth, sincerity, and faithfulness. 
With this ring, Annalise, I take you as my wife. He twists the ring around my finger, then looks at me. It isn't a pleading I see in his eyes. Perhaps it is hope. When I nod, he pushes the ring the rest of the way over my knuckle. Once again, the knowledge that I have not chosen my path surfaces. I have not taken the ring. Harley has placed it on me. Kiss her, Marty yells. Someone else whistles. Harley is not laughing this time. His chest rises and falls as if he has completed a magnificent feat and needs air. May I? His question pulls me from my thoughts of Nell. She would have loved this ring. I cannot speak. I nod and close my eyes. Nell is not here. I am. And I will fulfill her dreams. I lift my chin and anticipation courses through my veins. Nell's dream is becoming my reality. The back of Harley's finger caresses my cheek, and I instinctively lean into the light touch, craving more. I shiver as it grazes my earlobe before fingers wrap around the back of my neck. My knees go weak at the touch, and I place my hands on the rough linen of his shirt for support. His lips are rough but tender as they brush against mine for the briefest moment. I feel a deep rumbling under my palms before he pulls away. He rests his forehead on mine. Welcome to the family, Mrs. Harrison. Let's eat, Marty yells. I feel Harley's head shake before he pulls away. I am not sure if the smile that covers his face is from the kiss or from the hoots and hollers of the crowd. The band starts a lively tune. Harley offers his arm, and we lead the procession to the bounty these people have provided. Tears fall from my eyes and dampen the pillow beneath my head. There was no thought of Nell after that kiss, and guilt presses in on me. I turn the beautiful ring around and around my finger. I had wanted to keep her alive by living out her dream, but I have done nothing more than steal what was rightfully hers. Flopping face down, I let the pillow drown out the sobs that rack my body. I am a selfish, wicked child. I have always thought myself to be Ishmael, the survivor of Moby Dick. But I am Captain Ahab, maniacal and on a singular mission to avenge all the wrong that has happened to me. Moby Dick is an incarnation of my suffering. The white whale is my enemy and comes in many forms, but all lead to death. My nose is stuffy and I take deep gulps of air. Rolling over, I pull the crisp cotton sheet to my face and wipe away my tears before getting out of bed. The scent of dried lavender stays with me as I walk to the window. The moon is a sliver, but still gives off enough light for me to see the remaining smoke from the doused fire pit. The empty grounds show no remnants of the celebration except trampled grass. It's an image of how I feel, trampled and empty. Lord, I do not recognize my voice or the name I have uttered. Am I calling out to him for help or comfort? I need both. Nell would have done this long ago. Not me. Like Captain Ahab, I have nailed a gold doubloon to the mast and convinced myself to swear an oath to carry out vengeance against Moby Dick. But if I continue, I will not only sink the Pequod, but destroy everyone around me. I do not know what words to speak to a god I do not understand, a god who would allow such suffering. I stare into the night sky and out past the endless horizon until my eyes droop. My feet are cold and I climb back into bed. The heavy quilts tuck me in for the night. Tonight I long for the swaying of the train or wagon, but there is no movement beneath me. Waves pull me into their depths as I struggle to breathe. I sputter and flail my arms, trying to stay above the swells. I reach out my hand, grasping at anything that will save me. I've battled Moby Dick all night long. He has won. My ship is sinking and I am left to die. Where is my sister? 
Something has pinned my arms to my sides, and I am crushed by a weight on top of me. Annalise, I yell. Nellie! Someone is rocking me, wiping wet hair from my face. Has someone rescued me? I am freezing and my body shakes uncontrollably. Shh, shh, I hear, followed by soft humming. Nellie? Shh, dearest, everything is fine. It's over. It's all over. I open my eyes to a wild-haired Mr. Harrison and wide-eyed Harriet who is holding me. Harley stands in the doorway, concern etched on his face. Come, son, let's give the lady some privacy. I bury my head in Harriet's ample bosom and sob until I've spent my tears. I hiccup and she releases me. I am... I struggle to get the words from my still-shaking body. Sorry. Shh, dearest. You've been through quite an ordeal. Harriet pushes damp hair from my face and gently rubs a soft handkerchief over my cheeks before handing it to me. The door creaks. May I come in? Of course, dear, thank you. Harriet says when Mr. Harrison offers two cups of steaming liquid. Harley and I will get things cleaned up before Maria arrives, he says. Mr. Harrison looks from his wife to me, then back. Appearances. He is talking of Harley sleeping downstairs. Thank you, dear. Can you get your own breakfast this morning? There are plenty of leftovers from last night. He nods, then takes a step toward me. His hand covers the top of my head, and he is silent. When I look up, his eyes are closed, and his mouth is moving. He bends down and kisses the place where his hand was moments before. We will get through this together. He taps my shoulder before shutting the door behind him. We're up, so let's get a head start on our day. Harriet hands me a wool blanket and points. I rush to the outhouse, missing indoor plumbing, then hurry back upstairs. Harriet has my pillow airing on the chair. The log cabin quilt covers my now-made bed. Its masculine colors and red center symbolize hearth and home. The very thing I yearn for. I look up to see my dress from last night hanging limply over Harriet's arm. I'll spot clean your dress while you get ready. There's a little drip of ancho orange sauce I should take care of before it sets. She has turned the bodice inside out and stares at the large seams. Nell did not remove the extra fabric so I could let the dress out should I ever grow a figure like hers and mother's. Harriet fingers the fabric. Her wrinkled brow and pursed lips let me know something is bothering her. Her lips move as if working up the will to speak, but she does not, at least not about the dress. I'll see you downstairs in a few moments. Would you please bring our cups when you come? Of course, thank you. My thank you holds more meaning than I can convey, and she smiles in understanding. We are family, dearest. My legs are shaking, and I plop onto the edge of the bed, grasping the quilt in each of my hands. My gaze travels to the top of the wardrobe where Nell's hat box sits, the ribbon draping down the side begging to be pulled. Hiding secrets in plain sight is something I learned at an early age. I once wore Nell's missing brooch on my dress for three days before she noticed. You let me borrow it, Nell, don't you remember? Surely I wouldn't wear it in plain sight if I had taken it. I remember how exasperated she was and how cunning I felt. I do not want to hide secrets from these people, but I must. I will wear my new identity like that brooch. The smell of something delicious wafts up the stairs. I pull on my dress with haste and attempt to brush out my still damp hair. Leaving the part in the center, I twist the long ends into a bun and insert a few pins to hold it in place. It is messy, but it will have to do. The girl with puffy eyes and splotchy face I see in the mirror looks nothing like the woman from the night before. The everyday school dress I wear is drab, and I look younger than my 17 years. As if facing mother after receiving a poor mark on an assignment at school, I smile at myself and practice saying, Good morning, 
in a tone that sounds like nothing unusual has happened. My footfalls are light on the stairs, and I hear talking below. I listen before entering the great room. It isn't our place, Harley. If you need answers, then you speak with her. You're her husband. Mr. Harrison's voice is calm, but his tone is unwavering. When I hear no response, I enter. Good morning, I say as I placed on my practiced smile. Both men sip their coffee, looking at it as if there is a prize at the bottom of their cup. Well, don't you look like a young schoolgirl this morning. Here, come and sit. Mr. Harrison fried up ham slices from last night. Harriet escorts me to the table and places me across from Harley, who drains the rest of his coffee. I should get an early start, he says, and clunks his coffee cup on the wooden table. Oh, no, you don't. Not today, son. Harley has his hands on the table, ready to push out his chair. He slumps back down and crosses his arms. I can almost hear the word appearances rolling around in his mind. A blast of cold air hits my feet. In here, Maria, Harriet calls down the hallway. Ah, buenos dias, you have eaten? She looks from the four of us at the table to the mess in the kitchen. She rolls her eyes, and I cover my mouth with my napkin. Que lio, what a mess, she says as she searches for a place to put the large basket she is carrying before setting it on the floor. Her familiar words put smiles on everyone's face. Apparently, this is a morning ritual. Senor Harley, I have your picnic packed. You have a lovely day to be outside with your new wife. His back is to Maria and I watch as his expression goes from laughing to resignation to a forced smile before turning. Yes, thank you, Maria. My wife and I also appreciate all you did to make last night a wonderful celebration. Don't forget Isabel. She wanted everything perfect for you. Maria holds his gaze, and a new feeling surfaces. I want Isabel as a friend, but will not allow her to come between me and Harley. My breakfast finished, I stand and walk around the table, brushing the tips of my fingers on Harley's shoulder. You both helped make the evening a lovely one for me and my husband. I stare at her until I am sure she understands my meaning. A barely perceptible nod tells me she does. Chapter 12 Do you ride? Harley asks me as we walk toward the barn. I do. Well? Very. I'm hoping our discussions are more exciting than this for the rest of the day. He doesn't look in my direction. I follow his line of sight to a feed sack thrown over a fence. The sack moves. Isabel's ponytail falls forward as she brushes off her brown skirt. She's quite lovely, I say, my tone reminiscent of mother's. <laughs> Maybe some cow hand. I'd like to think I see beyond the surface to what's underneath. He turns to me, halting my steps. My breath catches. His intense focus on me causes my stomach to lurch. Maybe he knows my secret and is waiting for me to tell him the truth. My ribcage expands, and I force myself to relax my jaw to create the expressionless face Nell was so fond of. Don't pull that on me, Annalise. You are not the first to invent that look or that stance. He doesn't take his gaze from mine. I cannot withstand his perusal much longer. Impressive, he says. He turns, but not before I see an approving look flash across his face. I have won this battle, but my tactic won't work a second time. I am going to need the element of surprise. Here you are, sir, the hand says. The man has two horses ready for us. Harley adds our picnic lunch to the saddlebag. Might we walk a short distance so I can get a feel for the horse? I ask. His confused look changes in an instant. Three men now stand waiting to hear his reply. Of course, darling. He may not have meant his words, but my heart doesn't know what to do with the endearment. I shiver at his touch as he places the reins in my palm. 
My mouth goes dry, and I do my best to swallow. I hear faint noises, perhaps laughter in the distance. It sounds like I am underwater. I desperately need to come up for air. Meet Goldie, he says as we walk. Your question surprised me. Do you know what type of horse this is? I'm afraid I do not. I tuck away his comment. Tennessee walking horse. They have a smooth, easy gait. Quite remarkable animals. They withstand our weather, the mountainous terrain, and cover up to 50 miles a day if level. They make for an easy trail ride. When you asked if we could walk first, I wondered if you were checking the gate. No, I simply didn't feel comfortable doing this in front of your men. I reach down and grab the hem of the backside of my skirt and pull it up between my legs, tucking it into my waistband. My bloomers peek out from beneath the folds. Surprise looks good on Harley. His slack jaw closes and his Adam's apple moves up and down as I heft myself over the horse and settle into the saddle. Do you ride? I tease as I gently squeeze the middle of the horse's ribcage with my calves that are peeking out from beneath my skirts. I add a short clicking noise, and Goldie understands the cue and moves forward. Harley is right. A rider could sit this saddle for 50 miles, much better than our horses back home. I shake away the thought and focus on the bobbing head in front of me. Sleek golden yellow hair covers a well-muscled build. Lighter hair on the mane looks like wheat blowing in the wind. I hear nothing but the clip-chip, clip-chip, of Goldie's hooves on the hard ground. For a moment, I am at the lake. My papa and I are in an open field. Feel the horse, Loretta. Relax your shoulders. Good. Now close your eyes and become one with the movements. I close mine now. Penny for your thoughts. I startle and Goldie sidesteps. The wind stings my cheeks, and I realize I am crying. When did I become this weeping willow? You were far away. Back home, perhaps? Yes. The first word is hard to get out, but the rest flow like water over a swollen creek. My father, he was my best friend. My only friend, really. At least once a month we got away, just the two of us, to a cabin we had on the lake. We had a dog named Daisy. I choke on my memories. The words that spilled out only moments before are now dammed up. We are silent for several moments. Flossie. His single word pulls me from my memories. Pardon me? I turn and see him pat his horse's neck. I didn't name her, mind you. My mother did. As a colt, she got out and sampled the herbs from our house garden. Mother was not pleased. She dubbed this girl the mythological Roman goddess of flowers. That's a mouthful, so we call her Flossie. I'm clueless how we have changed to this conversation, and I look between Harley and Flossie, noticing how their dark eyes are both surrounded by long lashes. You might like today's destination. At least I hope so. Care to pick up the pace? He doesn't have to ask twice. I squeeze my legs and flick the reins before giving a yeah to Goldie. She seamlessly transitions into a canter. Fly like the wind, Goldie, I whisper. And she does. There is something unique about riding a horse that makes me feel alive. Every muscle in my body, most I haven't used in some time, work to keep me in balance with Goldie's rhythm. I repeat my father's words and relax my shoulders. I feel a pin loosen from my hair which quickly mimics Goldie's mane, bouncing around my shoulders and back with each fluid step. I reach up and remove the few remaining and place them in my pocket. Unlike a train's incessant clickety-clack or a wagon's creak and crackle, the sounds this magnificent animal makes are soothing and lull me into a peacefulness I have not felt since before father died. I release the reins, allowing them to fall around the saddle horn and spread my arms wide. Like music, the wind hums a tune in my ears. Whispered words soothe my soul. Trust me. I do not understand. Could this be what Mr. Harrison spoke of when he said God speaks to him? I listen more fully. 
The song I hear now includes harmony. It has a depth that complements my existing melody. A calm settles over me like sunlight through dense trees. I do not yet feel its warmth, but I see its rays. I'll be penniless by the end of the day. I grab the reins and steady myself. The harmony I heard was Flossie's heavier hoofbeats in cadence with Goldie's. I look from the dark chestnut with soulful eyes to her rider. You are a mystery, he says, just above a whisper as we slow our mounts. I offer a prayer that I will remain so. I think you'll like what is just over that ridge. You might want to hold on to the reins for this leg of the journey. The animals deftly pick their way up the incline. When we reach the top, I look out over a small valley. Blue water sparkles and cattle dot the landscape. I turn and see the Double H Ranch in the distance behind us. We have covered more distance than I'd realized. Are you comfortable going down that grade? It is rocky, but an established path is clear. I nod. Follow me, he says. That is when I notice the strap of leather around his chest. It is holding his arm against his body. I had not considered the ride might cause him pain. I also had not thought of the athleticism necessary to mount and ride one-handed. He sits well in the saddle, and I remind myself to focus on my surroundings, not the muscles under the top blue shirt leaning back into the saddle as we descend. What has become of me? I do not recognize this person. Has taking on Annalise's identity done this? Goldie snorts, and Harley slows and turns in his saddle. His gaze follows the direction Goldie is looking. What do you sense, girl? Harley's voice is low. We have stopped completely. Goldie makes the sound again. This time she adds a rattling sound that I can feel. Is there a problem? I ask. Could be a legitimate threat. Or maybe Goldie is fearful you'll fall off. His wink nearly does me in. Thankfully, his gaze does not linger long enough to see my shocked expression, or the flush rising. He is back to scanning the area. It's best to keep an eye out. Goldie can smell danger well before I'm aware. We continue picking our way down the slope. We have no rifle, and I realize Harley would struggle to manage one with the use of a single arm. Flossie maneuvers around a boulder, giving me a full view of her rider, the pistol strapped to Harley's right thigh is comforting, but should the possible threat be a large animal, he would need to be in close range to take it down. When we reach the bottom, cattle graze on still lush ground in the distance. The trees around us have all but lost their leaves, creating an inviting multicolored quilt beneath. Colors swirl as my eyes fill. Enough! I will not be a sniveling Sally! I wipe my eyes with my shirt sleeve, then dismount. Oh, I squeal. Sorry, I wasn't sure if you'd need assistance getting down. Harley's hand on my elbow is likely meant to steady me, but it has the opposite effect. I grasp his forearm and breathe deeply. That was not a good idea. The scent of sandalwood envelops me, reminding me of Papa. I'm whisked away in my mind. Really, Charles, she smells like a boy, Mother complains. I brought her home clean, Coraline. You can thank me for that. Besides, she wasn't eaten alive or carried off by mosquitoes. I giggle at the memory of his wink to me when Mother could not dispute the claim. Another penny lost, Harley says. I'm sorry? Oh, I remembered something my father used to say. I turn away from Harley and lead Goldie to the edge of the lake. It is large. Her hoof causes a ripple, and I watch it grow. When I hear a growl, I turn to see Harley struggling with the belt buckle holding his arm in. May I help? My voice sounds sheepish. He only nods, and his right arm drops, matching the other as if it too resigns itself to a helpless fate. It takes me a moment to see the problem. His shirt is caught on the buckle, and I work to not tear the fabric that is already worn in that spot. Thank you. What happened? Were you injured in the war? There I am, this side of me, 
the bold, ask-too-many-questions-that-are-none-of-my-business side. I know this person well. Sorry, it isn't my business. I should not pry. You should know the truth before someone else tells you. Now he is the mystery. Truth? The word feels like an oath on my lips. He wants me to know the truth when I am trying my best to keep my secrets hidden. Yes, I was injured in the war, but not like you might think. Let's stretch our legs. His arm sweeps out as if offering me the world. Should we be concerned about whatever Goldie alerted us to? I didn't see anything on our way down, but you're safe with me. He taps the weapon at his side. I do not feel safe. I feel conflicted. My body is warring with my mind. I must guard my words. He cannot learn the truth about me, or he will know we are not legally married. That can never happen. Because I know I have already fallen in love with my sister's husband. Chapter 13 Water gently laps over rounded rocks in varying shades of grays and browns. The water is clear and inviting, although it would be cold this time of year. Perhaps all year. Harley is doing his best to spread a quilt one-handed. I untuck my skirt from my waistband and do my best to smooth the wrinkles in my skirt before helping him. We work together in silence, then sit, enjoying the sounds of nature. I fished here often as a boy. This lake is teeming with wildlife. The catfish and walleye will give you a good fight, he says, breaking the silence between us. He quiets and looks down at the hand resting in his lap. His fingers flex and close into a near fist. I was fortunate to only serve three years and come out mostly whole, and with my life. Nasty business war. When he is quiet, I itch to fill the void. Mother's voice in my head reminds me to be silent. The sounds of nature fill the space. The rain hadn't let up for days. Two of us were tracking a band of renegades. We knew we were getting closer. There was an open field we needed to cross. I suggested we crawl, but my comrade thought we could make it and not lose the precious time it would take doing it my way. Lines form around his eyes as he tells the story, and I know this pains him. His eyes take on a faraway look I understand all too well. We ran. I heard a shot and picked up my pace. We were so close to the tree line. That's when I heard the second shot and the scream. I turned as I ran and saw Marcus go down. Then I slipped on a mud-slicked rock. I didn't want my rifle to hit the ground. I twisted my body, and when I fell, all my weight landed on my left arm. The pain was excruciating. Does it still hurt? I ask. That is a tough question to answer. After two years, the pain in my arm lessens. I have almost gained back full use of my hand, though it still tingles and still isn't as strong as my right. My shoulder is a different story. I can't raise my arm. No matter how much I try, I can't seem to get my strength back. He leans back on his good arm facing me, his long legs stretching far past the edge of the quilt. It's the pain of losing my friend that I'm not sure will ever heal. I don't know how to respond, because I doubt I'll ever get over Nell drowning. I have to change the direction of the discussion. Were the doctors not able to help? I suppose they could have done more if I'd sought immediate care, but I took the long way back to camp, if you know what I mean. They said I dislocated my shoulder and torn the muscles that would keep it in place. I tired of having it strapped to my side, so I let it hang, hoping no one would notice and I could get back to fighting but it isn't easy to shoot a rifle one-handed. What did you do? My commanding officer put me in charge of caring for the horses. I finished my time mucking stalls. He sounds disgusted, the way mother sounded when I fought the schoolboys at graduation, rather than be the lady she expected. It was an accident, I say. He sits back up and rubs his injured shoulder. I've been over that scenario hundreds of times. I was the more seasoned soldier. I should have... He clears his throat. 
The veins on his neck are more pronounced. Without thinking, I reach over and touch his sleeve. But he jerks away. I flinch. He stands. I don't know what I was thinking. This arrangement will never work, he says as he runs his fingers through already must hair. The abruptness with which I stand, as well as his words, make me lightheaded. I must sway, for he reaches for me. Annalise. His voice is as dark as his eyes. Everyone entrusted to me has died. I can't lose you too. I expect him to push me away, but his fingers grip my arm tighter. My heart soars at his words. I surprise myself and reach up with my other hand and draw him to me. My lips have tasted nothing as sweet. His are rough but gentle. He releases my arm and pulls me to him like he did when we danced. We are certainly not kissing to keep up appearances. A low noise similar to Goldie's when she sensed danger rumbles in his chest. He pulls away, his breath coming out in quick, uneven puffs. He places his forehead on mine, but does not release his grip around my waist. You'll be the death of me, not the other way around. His laugh is dry. Harley, I've lost everyone I love as well. Please, he pulls away, his arm dropping to his side and moving to his gun. Shh, he says. In one fluid movement, he pivots, and I am to his back. He looks at the horses. They have both stopped grazing and are looking at the same location up the path we navigated earlier. Could be a bobcat. They like to hole up in those rocks. He's more afraid of us and shouldn't be a problem. Now, where were we? It takes every ounce of energy left in me to raise a single eyebrow. I do not know to what you are referring. I kneel and begin packing up our meal. At least I'll die happy. I hear his whispered words and am thankful he cannot see my face. I'll collect the horses. His long strides carry him away. He is a handsome man, well-muscled. Even with a gimp arm, he is striking. I roll the quilt and we work together to put everything in its proper place on the horses. Without discussion, I remove the belt from over the saddle horn and wrap it around Harley's chest. He lifts his right arm and weaves his fingers through my hair. Hold your horses, mister, or we'll never get home. Trust me, I'm showing great restraint. His hand cups my neck as I finish buckling the belt. I do not resist. His kiss is an invitation for more. Flossie whinnies, causing Harley to laugh and take a step back. But he doesn't let go. I have not forgotten you, Flossie. You're still my girl. You just don't kiss as well. You've kissed your horse. Should I be jealous? He places a tender kiss on my forehead. Jealousy is an emotion I don't ever want you to experience. He holds Goldie's reins and shakes his head when I reach down to make my skirt more like pants. But he doesn't look away. I mount, and his wrist surrounds my ankle, pushing it into the stirrup a bit. Heat radiates from the spot when he lets go. He has no difficulty mounting Flossie, and quickly leads us back the way we came. Goldie bobs her head and snorts as we approach a rock just large enough I can see over, but not what is on the other side. I listen carefully, but hear nothing. Then a sound. Harley, I whisper, and pull Goldie to a stop. I heard it. That's no bobcat, he says as he dismounts, then pulls his gun. Stay put. Harley disappears behind the rock, and I hear murmurings. It feels like he has gone far too long. I am about to check on him when he rounds the corner. He has holstered his gun and is raking his fingers through his hair. What is it? Rattlesnake bite. He's in a bad way. His coloring has changed from golden brown to pale. The canteen he is trying to retrieve is stuck. I get down and move to help him. He is shaking. I place my hand over his and squeeze. He releases his grip and allows me to assist. I, I don't know how I'm going to move him. We'll work as a team, I say, willing him to look into my eyes. I've never been a team player. 
Even Nell and I simply coexisted in the same space. I do not understand the changes in me, but I embrace them. He nods and takes my hands. Squeamish? I hesitate. It can't be any different from gutting a deer. It is nasty business, but necessary. If I can do that, I can do anything, I say with confidence. Until we round the corner. The smell is overwhelming. The man's leg is dark purple and twice the size of his other. He has cut his trousers to above the knee. When he moans, I take a deep breath and move forward, offering him water. Breathing through my mouth, I turn to see Harley's brown hair pulled tight from his forehead. I'll go look for a branch. Perhaps we can put him on it and drag him behind the horses, he says. Or we can place him on mine. He turns, his eyes no longer smoldering with desire, but anger. Right, and how do you expect me to do that? He gestures to his arm, then spits into the dirt at his side. Teamwork. Harley stares off into the distance. Leave me to die. The man's words are faint. I will not leave another man behind, Harley says as he paces. I lighten my tone. Neither of us can do it on our own, but together. His abrupt turn startles me, but does not frighten me. I will not back down. Harley Harrison, you need me. We will do this together. I'll help get him onto your good shoulder, then you carry him up to the top of the rock. I'll have Goldie ready, and you can lay him over the saddle. When he protests, I cock my head. We can try it, he concedes. I go through the steps in my mind of how to move a deer. I'm hoping this man has some strength left to assist. We are all sweating and smell horrible by the time the man is on Harley's good side. I brace him as he uses his leg muscles to stand under the weight. When I see he is steady, I go around the rock to prepare Goldie and replace the canteen. Harley is above me moments later. He drops to his knees and helps the man into the saddle. Undo my arm, Harley says to me. Strap him to the saddle. I comply, wrapping the belt around the man's thin ribcage and the saddle horn, then pulling tight so he is lying across Goldie's neck. His arms flop to each side, and I wonder if he is still conscious. Thank you, Lord, Harley says. He pulls a cloth from the saddlebag and hands it to me. I'm puzzled that he would thank God for something he accomplished. Thank you. I wipe my face, then hands, before giving the cloth to Harley, who mimics my motions. I knew you could do it. Only with your smarts and God's help. His finger pushes a wayward strand from my forehead and tucks it behind my ear. I'll walk, he says. It's too far. We can both ride. I'll lead Goldie and she can walk beside us. I hand him Goldie's reins after he mounts, then climb up behind him. I place the reins in my right hand and take his left hand in mine and wrap both our arms around his waist, holding his close to his body for him. He intertwines his fingers with mine and pulls me in tight. When we reach the house, we are greeted by the three men from earlier who take Goldie and the man to the barn. We've got this, boss. You take care of your wife, one of the men says. Brown skirts swish near the barn door. The look on Isabel's face concerns me. I remember Harley's warning and lean my head on his back. I feel his hand tighten, then release. Can you get down without assistance? I am off before he finishes. You continue to surprise me. I love a good mystery. He is beside me then and pulls me to him. I plan on finding out all your secrets. He whispers, then releases me. He has no idea what his words do to me. Chapter 14 May I join you? Mr. Harrison asks before sitting beside me on the swing. I pull my legs up underneath my filthy dress and allow him to rock us. You did a brave thing today. Quite impressive for a young lady of such a sensitive nature. My stomach lurches. Is there anything you'd like to share with me? 
perhaps give some explanation as to how the Annalise of the letters is nothing like the one sitting here now? Emotions well up, but I push them down. I will not give in to these waves. I will face them head on, even if they threaten to cover me and pull me under. How is he? I squeak. Mr. Harrison takes a deep breath. He did not survive the trip. He was dead before the men took him from the horse. When my tears fall, he puts his arm around me and pulls me in like father used to. My emotions run pell-mell from the events of the day. Harley's kisses, his declaration to find out the truth, the death of the man we tried to save, are more than I can bear. Come now, dear, let's get you up to bed. I've made you a cup of chamomile tea. Are you hungry? Harriet says. I have not heard her approach and do not know how long I have cried, but I am exhausted. Her string of words and her arm around my waist as she assists me inside calm me some, but I'm afraid these tears will not stop any time soon. Harriet helps me into my nightgown, then brushes tangles from my hair as I sip the steaming tea. In the looking glass, I see dampness on her cheeks as well. She also knows loss. She braids my hair, takes my cup, then tucks me in. Her work-worn fingertips brush against my hair and remain. Lord God, she prays through her tears. This child of yours is in need of your tender care. You know the heavy burden she carries. We beseech you, Lord God, for restful sleep, free of whatever haunts her soul. I turn on my side and bury my face in the down-filled pillow. I will never get away from the demons that haunt me, because not even God can forgive me for what I've done. I wake late, my hand immediately going to my throbbing head. I work at remembering my dream. Nell's face floats before my closed lids. She is smiling. Mother is beside her, brushing at something on her dress. Nell's face tips up and I see my father place his arm around her and pull her tight. It is the first pleasant dream I have had in recent months. My head can't stand the pressure any longer. I sit up and scooch back to lean against the wooden headboard. Bright light streams through the window, and I wonder how I have slept so late. My arms above my head, I stretch. It is then that I see it. Nell's hat box lid is askew. Blankets tangle around my bare feet as I rush to pull the box from the top of the wardrobe. I fling it and myself onto the bed. My empty stomach threatens to find something to bring up when I open the lid. Each photo, letter, and item are neatly arranged, not haphazard as I always leave them. Why would someone take such care to organize the box but not properly close the lid? Unless they wanted me to know. My serviceable gray dress matches my mood as I hurriedly pull it over my head. The house is quiet as I walk down the stairs. A plate is on the table, but I cannot eat. Next to it is Nell's journal. I press my palms to my stomach, trying to calm my rapid breaths. I hear a sound and turn. Isabel stands beside the hooks where Maria's apron usually hangs. Her expression is a mixture of elation and anger, as if she is upset, but still has the upper hand. He's gone, she says with a smirk. I do not have to ask who she is talking about. If Harley read the journal, he knows I am a fraud. As are we, thanks to you. I came back because I wanted to do the right thing. You know, be honest, truthful. Oh, and to say thank you for the dresses. She sways her hips. The hem of Nell's dress swishes across the wooden floor. Why? I whisper. Why? Surely you didn't think you could keep this ruse up forever, Loretta. My name on her lips feels like a slap to my face. I lift my hand and touch the spot. Don't be coy now. You are a very bold woman taking on your sister's identity. Quite cunning, actually. I understand wanting something so badly I am willing to kill for it. 
Anger and fear boil in my gut, growing stronger with the combination. I clench my teeth and my fists. The truth is, Loretta, that it was more fun destroying you than actually killing you. And less complicated. You basically did it for me with that journal. I don't understand. Why do you hate me so? Her eyes turn dark, and her pretty face no longer looks attractive. Her nostrils flare, and she spits her next words. If I can't have him, neither can you. Heavy footsteps fall, and I look behind Isabel to see Mr. Harrison, his face hard. Your family is waiting, Isabel. She gives me one last sneer, as if I'm not worth her time, then turns. I recognize the signaling flags Mr. Harrison has raised. He is ready to do battle. But the ocean has already consumed my ship and all that is precious to me. I am floating on a coffin of my own making, with no hope of being rescued. Unlike Ishmael, I will perish like the rest of the crew. I had hoped to survive, Harley as my rescuer. But he is gone. In all my reflections, I have ignored the man in front of me. I hear him approach. Uncontrollable shaking makes it difficult to stay upright. I don't expect the embrace he gives and stiffen when his arms tighten until I can resist no more. I melt into him and sob. I knew this day would come. How I thought I could ever live this lie, I do not know. Grief can cause humanity to do the unthinkable. Vengeance and anger fueled my grief. Whether it was against Nell or God or both, I do not know. Mr. Harrison has helped me to the sofa where I dissolve into a puddle. It is Harriet's voice that pulls me from the depths of despair and anguish. Here, drink this. I am thankful she does not let go as my hands continue to shake. Peppermint tea trickles down my throat and my neck. She wipes at my mouth with a hanky that I know must smell of lavender, then places it in my trembling hand. Harriet sits beside me, her hand on my bouncing knee. Mr. Harrison is in the leather chair. I see his shoes still on his feet and look up into his red-rimmed eyes, but cannot maintain the connection. I've devastated him at my deception. He clears his throat and blows his nose. I feel Harriet press down on my knee, helping me still its motion. You have been through quite a bit in your 17 years, much too young to endure so much loss and uncertainty. I expect him to be cross or accusing. His voice is gentle. I had hoped you would come to us with your worries so we could help you. The moment we met... I knew you were not the genteel and proper Annalise of the letters. I had hoped in time you would share your story with us and allow us to share in the burden you carry. I don't... How did you know? My voice is squeaky and I cough. Harriet offers me another sip and I do not spill it this time. You rode up with a fierce-looking Indian. He chuckles. Indians were one of Annalise's greatest fears coming west. There were other small clues, but you confirmed my suspicions when you called out her name in your nightmare. I lower my gaze. Harley was in the doorway that night. Harriet pats my leg. We are not here to condemn you of your actions, dearest, but we would like the truth. You would honor us if you would share your story, she says. I have nothing to lose, for I have already lost everything. I owe them this much, and far more. My words fight for prominence as I begin, starting with my parents' deaths. I jump around with stories of my childhood, and being the son my father always wanted, to being an immense disappointment to my mother. I tell of how wickedly I treated my sister, her attempts to bridge the gap in our relationship, the cinnamon rolls and her burned fingers, and the days on end of not speaking to her. I can hardly understand my tear-filled words, but they will not be silenced. When I tell of crossing the Yellowstone River, my sister's inability to swim, 
how I cursed her by telling her I hoped she'd drown. Then my refusal to assist her when she was swept overboard. The tightness in my throat constricts my ability to speak and makes it difficult to breathe. I feel Harriet push me forward into my knees. Her hand moves in slow motion, creating ever-widening circles on my back. I focus on her gentle touch until my breathing is more normal, then sit up. The room is silent, but for the tap-tap of the heel of Mr. Harrison's shoe on the wood floor. Panic creeps up my spine, and I miss Harriet's touch as she leaves and walks to the kitchen. Where will I go? How will I provide for myself? When Mr. Harrison stands, I sit up straighter. He does not speak as he walks away. I bury my face in my hands and weep. In trying to do what I thought to be the right thing, I have made everything worse. Chapter 15 I do not hear Mr. Harrison return until he pulls out the kitchen chair and sits. I remain on the sofa, turning the ring on my finger. Truth, sincerity, and faithfulness. That is what Harley told me the sapphire symbolizes. I do not deserve this ring, Harley, or this family. Mr. Harrison does not speak, but I hear him rustling pages. What else in Nell's journal does he want to discuss? I've reheated the water, Harriet says. Come now, dearest, you need to drink something. She has not used my name. I don't even know what to be called anymore. Would you excuse me for a moment, please? I hurry to the outhouse, gulping great breaths of fresh air. It is cooler today, and I have not taken a coat or shawl. I might have continued walking had it not been so cold. Instead, when I've finished, I face my fate and return to the house. Nell's words ring in my ears. There is no such thing as fate, Loretta. God ordains our steps. Why these reminders come to mind now, I do not know. But I take one step forward with each word I repeat until I am standing in front of the kitchen table. Please sit, Mr. Harrison says. I obey. I've cried out all my tears, leaving only shame. I do not have the strength to argue. I pull out the chair across from him, and it scrapes against the wooden floor. Through puffy eyes, it is not Nell's journal I see, but a large book, an inkwell and quill beside it. Young lady, you have a few decisions to make. One palm gently smooths the page before him. I believe the first is what would you like to be called? Harriet joins us and places her hand over his. The touch is gentle, and I do not need to feel it to know that many unspoken words pass between them. How do I answer? My heart is torn. To remain Annalise, I will live a lie and lose my identity forever. To return to Loretta, I lose the man I know I love, if I haven't already. Either way, my life feels over. I shake my head. I do not want to choose. Let's start at the beginning. You've said you're Annalise's sister. She did not mention you in her letters. Do you know why? Perhaps she thought I would not come. It pains me to say this. I was so wicked to her. How old are you? I swallow. Seventeen. And a half, I add when I hear Harriet gasp. What is your given name? His question is quiet as is my response. Loretta. Harriet sips her tea as if they have all the time in the world for my explanation. I turned 17 in February. Annalise and I are nothing alike. I lied in the beginning because I owed it to Annalise to live her dream. She wanted this. I wave my hand. All of this. She wanted a family, a home to take care of, a husband to love, children to... My voice cracks. I do not know what else to say, and the silence drags on. What did you want? I look up, startled at his question. No one has ever asked me this before that I can remember, even father. 
I was always content just to be with him and did whatever he wanted to do. What did I want? What do I want? I want a chance to make up for my wrongs. I yearn for a chance to say I'm sorry. Forgiveness. Forgiveness from Nell. Oh, Nell. Proverbs chapter 19 verse 21 says, There are many devices in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord, that shall stand. Do you know what that means? I shake my head, unable to look at Mr. Harrison. In a nutshell, it means we can plan, scheme, and work toward what we think is best. But God's purpose will always prevail in the end. Young lady, I know you can't see it right now. But God has a reason for all that has occurred. How? I choke out. How can my sister's death and my actions possibly be God's plan? You said in the beginning you lied to carry on your sister's name. But why did you continue? You are a strong young woman. I cannot believe it was out of fear. I feel my face contort, because I know why I did not tell the truth. Mr. Harrison is wrong. It is fear. Fear of losing Harley. I grab at my bodice, trying desperately to relieve the pain in my chest. My heart is breaking because I know I already have lost him. There is no use pretending any longer. I lift my chin. I just want this to all go away. I twist the ring from my finger and slide it across the table. Loretta Marine Fritter. My words full of resignation. All righty. Now we are getting somewhere. I rub my chest to help alleviate the pain. Harriet hands me a fresh hanky and I wipe my eyes. I hear scratching and watch as Mr. Harrison writes in the book in front of him. As my vision clears, I see it as a Bible. Even upside down, I see the swirling ends of the first letter in Annalise's name. Annalise Marie Fritter. Birth, June 8th, 1847. Marriage, December 24th, 1867. Death, August 10th, 1868. Drowning, Yellowstone River, Montana. In an unused space, he adds my name. The pen scratches the paper as he makes the loop on the L of my name. I don't understand, I say in a whisper. He does not respond until he has finished writing my name. The quill hangs suspended over the paper, and I offer the missing information, which he jots down. Loretta Marine Fritter. Birth, February 2nd, 1851. The quill rocks slightly when he lays it on the table, while his puffs of air work to dry the ink on the paper. I promised your father we would care for his children, should something ever happen to him and your mother. I plan on keeping that promise. You will remain in our home. Although I am thankful for his offer, especially with winter setting in, I cannot imagine spending another day with his family, knowing I can never have Harley. Chapter 16 Harley has not returned to the house. I've remained in my room for two days. Harriet has provided for my needs. I have reread every letter, every journal page, and the letters Mr. Harrison gave me that Nell wrote. There is no comfort, no solace in the words, only a reminder of how wicked I am. In my mind's eye, I see Nell using paper to start our fire each morning. I know this is what happened to the rest of her journals. She sacrificed so much for me. I will never be able to repay her. My heart aches with regret. The stairs creak, and I hear a soft knock at my door. Come in, I say. Did you sleep well, child? Harriet walks over and picks my crumpled dress from the floor like she has done each morning. She shakes it, then drapes it over the back of the chair. When she finally makes eye contact, I shrug. Come down and have something to eat. Then we can sit on the swing and chat. The rocking motion lures me, anything to quell the crashing waves in my head. Harriet helps me dress and brushes my hair without sound. 
you head on out and I'll bring toast and tea momentarily. When she joins me on the porch, the tiredness in her eyes concerns me. The smile on her lips appears genuine as she hands me the cup and linen with dry toasted bread. Thank you. I'm hoping you'll fill up to helping me make apple strudel this afternoon. Maria left apples and a few have brown spots. I need to use those up before they ruin the entire bushel. I know she is doing her best to throw me a lifeline to keep me from drowning, but I feel lost at sea. In my Bible reading time this morning, I came across a verse I have underlined and read many times. She does not continue, and I wonder if she is waiting for approval from me to continue. I smile at her and nod, all the while brushing crumbs from my lips. Psalm 37, verses 23 and 24. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. I'm sorry, I'm not sure I understand what that means, I say. It can be confusing, I suppose. In my unlearned mind, I believe it is saying that for those who love God and are following his ways, no matter what happens, no matter our mistakes, he will work everything for good. A puff of air releases from my nostrils and crumbs scatter. I'll trust you with the meaning, but there is a key component to that verse that doesn't apply to me. She stops the motion of the swing and turns to me. I wasn't following in his ways. I brought this on myself. I am fully to blame. Hmm. It is a strange response, this simple murmur. I expected a lecture like mother would have given, or at least a guilt trip reminding me of all the ways I've failed. You know, it could apply from this moment forward, Harriet adds. I've been to church all my life and know to what she is referring. Mrs. Harrison, I believe in God, I do, but... I shake my head and release a pent-up sigh. That is the beauty of forgiveness, dearest. When we repent and truly turn from our sins, forgiveness is there. Do you believe this? I believe God can forgive me, but how can I ever forgive myself? The guilt is too much. The blood of Jesus not only offers forgiveness for sins... It also resolves our guilt. God's forgiveness brings self-forgiveness. If we believe God has forgiven us, there is no need for us to be angry with ourselves. When we accept Jesus as our personal Savior, He cleanses us, makes us a new creation. Even if God can forgive me and I forgive myself, how will others? I choke on my words. How will Harley ever forgive me? Hmm, I thought that might be what this was about. Well, that's something you'll have to discuss with Harley. She looks out over the land before continuing. Forgiveness doesn't mean there are no consequences. Those may linger, but God will use everything for good according to his purpose, as it says in Romans chapter 8, verse 28. The muscles in my stomach quiver, and I pray the toast stays down. How will I ever face Harley? Loretta, God has allowed you to be here with us at this very moment for a reason. It may not be how you had planned, but it was by God's design. He's known all along how this was going to turn out. Perhaps you should start by talking to him. She pats my knee and stands, taking my cup and napkin with her into the house. My foot pushes the swing back and forth with force. I lift my feet and feel the sway until it gradually slows. No matter how much force I give it, the swing always returns to its original position. I've been pushing far too long against my parents, my sister, God. God, I whisper, I don't know how you can forgive me. And I don't understand how I'll ever be able to forgive myself. But I am asking you to change my heart and make me a new creation, a new me. Forgive me.
My words are not emotional or fraught with tears. There is no pleading with God, because I know by my simple request, He has answered me. Chapter 17 Ten days. I've counted every single one. Harriet has not mentioned Harley again, and I can't bring myself to say his name aloud. I keep my mind and hands busy as Harriet and I work side by side each day, cooking, cleaning, and doing laundry. All the things I once hated are now a soothing balm for my still troubled soul. It takes both of us to stay on top of the exhausting work, but Harriet has not mentioned Maria's name either. My curiosity gets the best of me, and I smile, seeing little pieces of me return each day. How long did you know Maria? Her hands are still for a moment, then resume whisking the yolks for the custard she is making. Eighteen years, I guess. Mr. Harrison hired her husband, Jose, when we first arrived in Montana. One day after being with us for a year, he asked if he could send to Mexico for his wife. We didn't even know he was married. Mr. Harrison made the arrangements. It took two years for Maria to arrive. Can you imagine waiting that long? I do not respond. My fists punch the dough I am kneading harder than necessary. She didn't speak a lick of English. Oh my, those first months had some disastrous moments, but we learned to laugh at all of them. She chuckles, then sobers. Maria learned she was pregnant with Isabel the week I lost Helen. She wipes her tears with her apron, leaving a smudge of white on her cheek. I suppose that is why she coddled the child, gave in to her every whim. She did not understand that it is loving to guide a child, even if that means a spanking now and again. Isabel always got her way. I knew it would be the ruination of the girl, but I was not in a position to speak, nor was it my place. It is hard watching people make mistakes. I think of how my father indulged me, and wonder if it had to do with my baby brother Walter's death. Perhaps mother resented this, Maybe she wasn't trying to break me, but to correct me from the path she knew would lead to my destruction. Letting the Garcias go was difficult, but necessary. Isabel needs formal schooling and discipline. Maria and I spoke of it often. They had planned to send her next year. Her actions necessitated an earlier admittance. Knowing I was not the only reason for their decision helped settle my heart. Harley asked about you this morning. I think I am breathing. My eyes blink, so I know I am not dreaming. Me? He's here? Her wry smile does not tell me if she is teasing or telling the truth. This is a busy season for us, and with Jose and Maria both gone, he's been working long hours and taking his meals with the other hands. He moved into the Garcia's cabin. She pokes me with her elbow, waking me from my stupor. See, God worked it all out for good. Needing another worker forced Harley to do what was necessary, proving to himself he is still capable of a hard day's work. The empty cabin allowed for you to have your own space, and it has given him a chance to get out from under our roof. Besides, it has given you both time to heal and grow. I nod. I can do no more. Learning to see God's hand in the details does not come naturally to me. Harriet often has to spell it out for me. What do you plan to do about Harley? She asks, her words as nonchalant as if she were asking if my tea needs sugar. I... My mouth remains open, but words do not form. She giggles. I guess you're a little gun-shy about making plans these days. Her wink lets me know she is teasing, but she has hit her mark. I do not know how to reach out to him and say as much. I don't know what to do. One step at a time, dearest. Yes, but in what direction? Hmm, now that is a good question. She takes the custard she has poured into a pan and places it in the oven as I position a towel over my dough for it to rise. We clean up in silence. Let's rest our feet, shall we? 
Harriet reclines on the sofa, and I fall into Mr. Harrison's chair. The Bible is sitting on the table beside me, and I finger the soft leather cover. What do you know of the Israelites and the Red Sea? She asks. They were running from the Egyptians and got caught at the edge of a great expanse of water. The people were sure they were going to die, but God made a path for them. Her nod lets me know I have answered correctly. I'm amazed at how her encouraging words have helped me over the past days. She puts a small pillow behind her head before speaking again. The Israelites were stuck. They'd gone as far as they could. The sea was before them, and they couldn't turn back or they'd run into their pursuers. Even if they went to the left or right, they would die. They had nothing left but to cry out to God. I've learned that when there seems to be no other way, God makes one. She closes her eyes, and I expect to hear her gentle snore. But she continues. Then the Lord spoke. He asked them why they were crying out to him. He told them to go forward. I'm sure the people thought it too hard a task. But that is when God moved. I don't know which came first, the step or the parting of the sea. But those Israelites still put one foot in front of the other in obedience. She peeks out from under her closed lids and smiles. You may not know what to do or what to say to Harley, but you need to take a step in his direction. Just do the next thing, Loretta. It won't be easy, and it may need to be by faith, but take a step forward. Don't worry about the outcome. God will take care of that. You do the right thing. I stare at the flickering flames of the fire, unsure if I can do what she's asked. I'm afraid, I say. That kind of fear is from the devil. Jesus told us not to be afraid. What would I say? You purpose to do the right thing, and the Lord will guide you. You'll know. Her words quiet, and even breaths puff from her parted lips. I pull the Bible into my lap determined to take my first hesitant steps into the Red Sea. Chapter 18 We are sorely in need of fresh meat. I know they must move the cattle north, but I'd like to put up for the winter, not use up our stores, Harriet says as she slices thin strips of meat into a pan of hot oil. I'll go. I sit up straight in the kitchen chair where I am peeling potatoes, for the first time in two weeks, I feel something flicker inside me. My mind races. Father's rifle is still in the crates in the barn. The rush of adrenaline has me tapping my bare feet on the cold wooden floor. It is when I realize Harriet has not responded that I look up. She is staring at me, but not in horror at my words. Her expression is a mixture of awe and concern, most likely for my safety. I can do it. I've done it dozens of times. But not here. You don't know your way around. My mind goes to Isabel's favorite spot. We watched deer drink from a stream as we hunkered behind a large boulder. We saw deer tracks, and others that I guessed to be elk, from the extra dot at the base of their separated hoof. Even wolf and coyote, or possibly dog, which I have yet to distinguish. I know exactly where to go. It is south of here, not far. Isabel showed me. Surely I can find my way back there and home. Harriet gives me a single nod, then turns back to the stove. I take that as permission, and my entire body wiggles in excitement, like I am escaping the confines of my cocoon. My mind reels with possibilities. Elk would be a challenge for me to manage alone, but not impossible with Goldie's help. The thought of deer meat makes my mouth water. I may even see turkey, though I would bring home only feathers since my sharps would likely annihilate such a bird. Are you going to peel those potatoes or not? Harriet is smiling, and I match hers with a big one of my own before making a swift cut with my knife. I'll need rope, ammunition, and the box with flint and steel. I can't forget tinder, water, food, warm clothing, my gaze flickers to Harriet's back. I'll be up in the middle of the night. 
She'll never know what I wear until I've returned. I'm finished, I say, while wiping my hands on a towel. I know there is more to do, but would you mind if I went to the barn to get a few things from one of my crates? Go on, dear. I think she is holding back a smile. Did she plan this? Is she giving me an opportunity to be me? I rush out into the cold. Thick clouds cover the sun. Hunting in the rain is not my first choice, but the weather does not dampen my spirits. The crate lid is tight and takes several attempts at prying with a bar to get it open. Straw pokes at my hands as I reach in. The moment my fingers touch the hilt, memories of hunting trips with my father flood my mind. Never be in a rush, Loretta. Let your imagination guide you, as if you are the deer. You cannot will an animal to provide you with the ideal shot, but you can release a bullet that will kill the deer quickly if you are patient. Always remember, the animal you shoot is giving his life up for our next meal. Treat him with respect and the dignity he deserves. I pull out the gun wrapped in the trousers and shirt father kept at the cabin for me. Mother never knew, nor did Nell, I surmise. I blow off bits of straw from the rifle's barrel and run my fingers along the cold, smooth metal. It will need to be cleaned. Disturbing as little as possible, I plunge back through the straw for the other items I will need. My fingers encircle a ceramic handle, and grief threatens to choke me. It is interesting how memories can haunt or thrill. Nell offered me more than hot chocolate last Christmas morning. She'd offered me a fresh start to a new day. But I had ignored her thoughtfulness, thinking only of myself. I pull the mug from its grave and place the cool object against my cheek. I think of her hand slapping the spot before I uttered my last words to her. I hope you drown. Lord, I know you have forgiven me but will I ever be able to forgive myself? It wasn't your fault. I startle and the mug tumbles from my fingers back into the straw. Harley stands in the barn opening, sunlight behind him creating an otherworldly effect. I almost wonder if I am imagining him until he walks to me and crouches down. He rests his right arm on the crate's edge and fingers the straw. You said similar words to me. Perhaps you need to hear them as well, he says. I can only stare at him. There is a streak of dirt on his cheek above his unshaven jaw. A slight curl from his too long hair peeks out over his shoulder. He looks at everything but me. I feel an urgency to speak, to beg for his forgiveness. But no, my words will run together if I do not tamp down the tumult within me first. I was at the house. Mother said you were out here. Are you going somewhere? I follow his gaze to the window at the top of the barn that needs to be fixed. The slight opening allows enough air to blow the dust particles above us. When I turn back to him, I stare into his dark chocolate eyes. Hunting, I eke out from my constricted throat. Hunting? Alone? He drops to one knee and fingers the rifle with appreciation. I pull out the box of ammunition and supplies and hand them to him, then repack the mug, pushing the straw down with more force than needed. My skirts have become entangled around my ankles, and I struggle to stand. Allow me. His hand is warm as it takes mine. I wish for him to pull me to him and whisper in my ear that everything is going to be fine and all is forgiven. When I am upright, he releases my hand and takes a step back. Meet me in the morning at five o'clock. We'll walk to my hunting spot. Before I can respond, he's gone. Chapter 19 Even the birds still sleep. I wake to the sound of water dripping from the roof after last night's rain and open my eyes to a dark sky. The moon peeks through clouds, giving hope for a bright day. Cloudy skies make it more difficult for spotting deer movement, but a clear sky and cool temperatures provide the best hunting conditions. This day, I hang my dress and don the trousers and shirt. My boots will be tight with the thick woolen socks, 
but necessary with the hours of stillness required for hunting. Hours. How will I manage hours of quiet when I have so much I need, no want, to say to the man who will be beside me? I smell the coffee before I enter the kitchen. There is no smile on his haggard face as he hands me a cup. I expect him to say something about my attire, but only see resignation in his eyes. Are you sure? He asks. Three words. I am sure of nothing. I only know it is imperative I be me, even if that means losing Harley. Of course, I say, then take a sip of the steaming brew. He hands me a biscuit filled with ham and cheese. Received word this week that the Fort Laramie Treaty is in effect. We aren't in the Black Hills, but it is wise for us to honor our Sioux friends. We will not hunt elk today. Stick with deer or bear. His words confuse and concern me. We rarely saw bear near our cabin. We set our empty cups in the basin and head to the front door where our gear awaits. I reach for my shoes. You might prefer these. Harley holds out a pair of worn boots. I do not hesitate or think to thank him. I stuff my feet and trousers in. There is just enough wiggle room, and I feel an indentation from the previous owner's toe. My skin heats, wondering if these belong to Harley. Jose left them behind, along with a few other items they could not carry. Ready? I hear his slow, full intake of breath. Is he second-guessing going? The jacket he has handed me is much too large, but warm, and I feel like a bear after hibernation. I sling my gear over my shoulder and place my hand on the door. Thank you, I finally whisper. I mean it for the boots, for the breakfast, for speaking with me, for so much more. This is the brotherly affection I must learn to accept. We walk in silence and I realize we are walking in the direction I'd planned. Where are we going? I ask. A little pond just south of here. He takes great care to not touch me as he points in front of me. Mother would call him well-bred. An individual able to be civil when he loathes you is more than just polite with good manners. Harley is much more. The wind is in our favor. There is an outcropping of rock where we can settle. It's one of my favorite places. I've always dreamed of building a home there. It is Isabel's spot. She had hoped for Harley to build that home for her. They grew up together. I wonder if he shared that dream with her and it became her own. My heart grows heavy, and I change my line of thinking, focusing on the steps I took to clean my rifle last night. I took it apart twice and repeated the steps, like I do in my mind now. You came over the Bozeman Trail, did you not? Yes, I believe so. At least part of the way. We stopped at Fort Laramie. Why? His question catches me off guard. Something I cannot afford. I must stay focused. According to the news we received when we ran into some soldiers on the trail, that fort is no longer. The residents abandoned it in August. Then Red Cloud, the Aglala Lakota leader, burned it to the ground. I stumble and think of Hota and Lakota. Would they be required to give up their positions and join their people on the reservation the U.S. government has established? Had I gone with Hota, would they have assigned me the same fate? There is no such thing as fate, Loretta. God directs our steps. So even though we are not technically in the Black Hills, Lakota has advised us to be wary. Even if you see elk, do not shoot it. From the sound of his voice, I can tell he is looking at me, even though I am focusing on each footstep in the unfamiliar boots in the darkness. How can he act as if nothing is wrong and carry on such a conversation? The moisture in the air weighs down my coat. Or is that my sorrow, the accumulation of my regrets? Harley points to the outline of what I know is the rock. In silence, we prepare our weapons. I place my supplies on the ground and find the best place to settle. My sharps is a breech loader and makes a loud click when I ready it, echoing in the stillness. All the times I had an opportunity to speak but didn't bear down on me now that I must be quiet. A single sound can ruin our chances. Harley perches his rifle on the rock, 
and nestles it into the crook of his good shoulder. His feet remain on the ground, but he leans in, his head like an extension of the stone. I am shorter, so I climb on top of the rock and lie flat, not caring if my splayed legs are improper. Everything about this moment is inappropriate. He is being too kind, almost forgiving. Perhaps he has. Is he giving me another chance? I do not allow the hope wanting to soar to break free from its confines. It is too much to process. Birds announce the break of day. Moments later, the first rays of light peek through the trees to the east. Even the fish are waking. Small circles form across the water, growing larger until they intersect with another. It is my favorite time of day, and I watch the sun dance on the water. With each ripple, the water glistens and sparkles, carrying the light like precious jewels further out. A home would fit perfectly, nestled into the trees and the small rise to my right. A front porch with rockers or a swing would be a soothing place to sit each morning to see the sunrise. The small clearing beyond would be the ideal spot for a kitchen garden with a chicken coop at the far end. Enough sun in spring and summer, but sheltered from the bitter winds of winter. Our bodies remain motionless for hours, but my mind runs wild. Isabel's dark skin, Harley's firm embrace, his ardent kiss. These memories fill my thoughts. I must sigh because Harley shoots me a cross look. I return my focus to the woods. Movement catches my eye even before a blue jay sounds the alarm to an approaching intruder. I scan the area for anything that does not fit. Then I see him. The white patches around the buck's eyes and muzzle move as he scans the area before stepping beyond the tree line to the water's edge. It is a mule deer, his large ears giving him away. His rack is not the largest I have seen, but the girth around his neck tells me he will be heavy to drag home. Harley must see him as well, for he adjusts his rifle. I follow my father's instructions and imagine what the animal will do. He will bend down to drink. His bony head will face us. I'll need to wait until he turns to go and exposes his shoulder. I envision where his lungs are under the thick grayish brown hair. It will require careful placement to take him down quickly, to protect his dignity. He is large, as is the target area. But that also means so are the bones and muscles in the shoulder. It must be a clean shot. I must be patient. I ready myself for the right moment, steadying my breaths, which come out in white streams through my nostrils. The deer exposes a portion of his neck. Bang! The shot beside me shocks me, but does not deter me from my mission. My eyes remain on the deer. Rather than dropping, the deer bounds into the air, pushing off with all four legs at the same time. In his upward motion, I see my opportunity and take my shot. He drops with a thud I can hear across the water. A grouse takes flight, creating a stir from the thick undergrowth, and I track it into the trees. Adrenaline rushes through my veins as elation fills my heart. When I turn and see Harley's face, all jubilation is gone. There is a look of disgust that deflates my mood. I hang my head. Shame fills me. That should have been his kill. I... My words are stuck. I see any future with Harley pulled below the ocean surface. I curse Moby Dick. In my desire to be myself, I have destroyed any possibility for a future with the man before me. Chapter 20 Have you done this before? Harriet asks as she sharpens a long blade on a whetstone. Yes, with my father, and I helped some women skin a bison on our journey. That was an experience. I remember the revulsion on Nell's face at my bloodied skirts. The grinding of metal on stone grates on my raw nerves. I put fresh straw under the deer, which has been hanging for five days in the barn. Five torturous days. Harley disappeared the moment his workers came on horses at the sound of the shots. Their exuberant congratulations and exclamations of exceptional shot made things worse. 
Harley's mood darkened as they drug the animal back. I heard you took this one down, Harriet says. Where did you hear that? My sheepish reply does not match the force with which I make the first jab to get between skin and meat. Harley? She remains still, and I know she is watching my response. My eyes blink. She's spoken to him. It's taken him a few days to get over the embarrassment of being outshot by a woman, but he's come around. Stilling my knife, I look into mirthful eyes. You two are something else, both wanting the same thing yet fighting against each other. He said your patience and skill won out over his fair and square. I didn't realize it was a competition. It was when he was trying to impress you. Impress? Why? Her laughter echoes in the space. Oh, dearest, perhaps it is your naivete, but my son is smitten with you. Maybe in a big brother way. Though I know full well the kisses we shared were more than that. But that is when he thought I was Annalise. He only went hunting with me because he was worried about my safety. There is some truth in that. He was worried. Didn't sleep a wink. We stand there in the barn's quiet. Could there be the possibility for something more? I return to my work of pulling the hide and cutting it away from the meat with my knife tip as Harriet sharpens another shorter blade. Mr. Harrison told me he fell in love with me the first time he saw me wring a chicken's neck. She laughs. Not very romantic, but he said he saw a strength in me he admired. I'm thinking my son sees the same. Her words end in a question as if I should be able to give an answer. What was I thinking? I left the salt in the house, she says. Harriet lays the knife she has been sharpening on the bench before leaving. I continue my work, focusing on my task. I hear her return moments later as I crouch down to work around the dangling front legs. Need some help? The deep voice startles me, and I fall onto my rump, still holding my knife in one hand and the skin attached to the deer in the other. The animal and I both sway and Harley blurs as I fall back. Careful there. He grabs the wrist with the knife and removes it from my hand, placing it on the bench. I brush off the seat of my trousers when I stand. Need any help with that? His roguish grin makes my cheeks burn, both sets. I move my hands from the larger and place them on the ones on my face. We need to talk. He shakes his head like he is retracting the statement, I would like to talk with you. He nods as if he's happier with this wording, but he sobers. I am not happy at all. His grin has turned serious. I wipe my hands on my apron and look him full in the face. I am sure he can see my heart beating. I may have had more patience with hunting, but I do not possess that skill now. His silence is killing me. I'm sorry, I blurt out. I'm so sorry, Harley. I never wanted to deceive you. No, that's not true. I pace. I never wanted you to get hurt. How was I to know my sister married someone I would fall in love with? I expected you to be a stodgy, bald-headed weasel of a man to accept my sister. My back is to him, and I finger the hilt of the knife he has placed on the bench. I need to slay all my demons, but not with a harpoon or knife. I need to ask forgiveness. Harley, I understand if you can never forgive me. I'm having trouble forgiving myself. But please know I am truly sorry for misleading you. I thought being Annalise would fix my mistakes. I'm asking for your forgiveness. I turn to see his head hung, with fingers splayed and running through his too long hair. I've lost him. My eyes burn but tears will not fall. I'll take you up on your offer, I say as my shoulders slump. His head pops up, and confusion covers his features. To leave, I'll speak with your father. He will know of a safe place to send me. Harley is before me in two strides, and I back up against the bench. Don't go, please, Loretta. It is the first time he has said my name, and it nearly does me in. 
My vision blurs and tears threaten at what might have been. It's all right. I'm used to being on my own. Maybe I could get a job in a butcher shop. I laugh, but it sounds dull. I want you to stay, he says. You don't need to say that. From the first moment you saw me, you let me know I am nothing like what you wanted. Do you remember that? He reaches out and gives my braid a soft tug, causing my head to tilt. His fingers run down the bumps, then he twists it around his finger. I said that because what I thought I wanted was a dull, unattractive, prim woman. Someone mousy who would be more likely to accept me, even with my gimp arm. I open my mouth to protest, but he covers it with his finger. No, it's my turn to speak. I am the one needing to ask forgiveness. I have been unfair to you since the beginning. I've been so consumed by my self-loathing that I haven't treated you fairly. I'd like a chance to try again, to start over. What do you say? I can only stare. His finger has moved to my jawbone, tracing it to my ear and sending shivers up my spine. Loretta Fritter, I'd like to court you proper-like. You'll have to ask my guardian, I say, then wink. I already did. His kiss is tender and hints at the promise of more. Chapter 21, April 1869. I hear cows, I say, dropping the spade in my hand. Dirt covers my hands and trouser knees, and I brush both off as I stand then give a hand to Harriet to assist her. Sure enough, I see the dust rising. They're coming home. You clean up here, I'll get the roast on. Harley is home. My pulse quickens, and I run my fingers over my hair. My hair! I pick up our basket of seeds and tools and run to the barn to put them away. Chickens scatter pell-mell as I race back to the house, jumping both steps. Harriet glances down at my dirty shoes on her kitchen floor, and my eyes go wide. Oh, sorry. I am so flustered I turn in a circle, not sure what to do. Child, you do beat all. Drop your shoes and get yourself to the bathhouse. And take a clean dress with you, she yells to me as I take the stairs two at a time to my bedroom. She is standing at the bottom of the stairs, holding my shoes when I return. Walk. We don't need any broken bones. He'll be a few hours yet, and we'll need his own bath before I let him sit at my table. Yes, ma'am. There is a quiver in my voice I do not recognize. I don't recognize many things about myself these days. But it isn't because I am pretending to be someone else. It's more that I am growing into who God made me to be. This family accepts me the way I am, but loves me enough to help me grow into who I can become. No one belittles me when I wear trousers when doing certain chores or riding. I've learned to enjoy cooking and household duties, though I doubt I'll ever enjoy laundry day, especially in winter. Harriet has taught me to knit and crochet, but hasn't forced me to sew, although I may need to soon. My dresses are getting tight in the bodice and need to be let out. The girlish figure is giving away to a roundness I could have only dreamed of. Mr. Harrison has helped me grow into a deeper relationship with God. He makes scripture come alive. My favorite time of day is sitting near the fire, doing needlework as he reads to us. I count my blessings as I brush my now clean hair and realize I could brush it a hundred times and not run out of things to thank God for. I run the towel over the ends, then twist the long strands into a knot and poke several hairpins in it to hold it in place. My 18-year-old self looks much different from the girl who arrived seven months ago. I smell the roast and feel guilty for not helping Harriet. She likely has not had a chance to even change from her work dress. I descend the stairs more slowly this time, not wanting to jostle my hair loose. I shouldn't have taken so long. I'll take over here while you freshen up, I say when I enter the kitchen. That would be lovely. The bread will be ready in two or three more minutes. I just checked it. Taste the Crowder peas. You know how I like them a little firm. She takes off her apron. 
Oh, and please get the apple butter. There's a jar on the top shelf. I've got this. You go on. I shoo her, much like she does to Mr. Harrison, lovingly and with a gentle spirit. I pull out the bread and slather a pat of butter on top. I lift the lid on the venison roast, potatoes, and carrots, and breathe in the aroma. Tasting the crowder peas, I move them off the heat. Harriet has already set the table, so I clean up the counters and wash the remaining dishes. I'm forgetting something. Apple butter. I snap my fingers and open the door, stepping back so I can see the top shelf. There you are. I grab one jar and move the others closer to the front. Need some help? The jar slips from my hands, and I grab it before it hits the floor. Harley. My voice is breathy. Welcome home. His gaze traces over me so fully, I feel as if he has physically touched me. I could get used to this he says. He takes the jar from my hand and places it on the counter before pulling me close. Water droplets fall and darken his collar. Very used to this. He kisses my forehead, then my temple. His hand brushes against my ear as he cups the back of my neck. I hear the low rumble of danger emanate from his chest. Marry me, he whispers, as he places his chin on top of my head. I want the words I think I've heard to be real. I feel his heart beating. Heat radiates from his skin and warms me. He takes a step back and kneels before me. My hand goes to my mouth. Loretta Fritter, will you do me the honor of becoming my wife? Yes, yes, I repeat. Praise the Lord, Harriet squeals from the hall. Congratulations, son, Mr. Harrison says as he rounds the corner and offers his hand. When? Harriet claps her hands together. Tonight, Harley says in a husky voice. Tonight? How? Set another plate for dinner, mother. There was a U.S. Marshal I met on the drive who was more than happy to provide his services in exchange for your home cooking. Harley reaches over and kisses his mother on the cheek. Mr. Harrison, get a jar of pickled beets. We have company. Epilogue Harley waves the fishing pole tip at me. Even from this distance, I can see his silly grin. I move back and forth on the porch swing, which creaks under my extra weight. Harriet thinks we are having twins. I'm beginning to think she's right. I hear a hoot and watch as Harley does this ridiculous dance as he flicks the fish from the water and onto land, then tries to catch the flopping animal one-handed. He has learned to adapt to using his right hand and arm for most everything, but it is his mind that amazes me. He drew up plans, marked the land, and coordinated the building of this house in only a few weeks. It took Mr. Harrison longer to make the swing. The baby kicks and I run my hand over the foot pushing back at me. I never dreamed I would possess such a love, but God and this family has changed me. I tried to create my own destiny, but I'm much happier with the plans God had in mind. The End For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, Plans to give you a hope and a future. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. Afterward. Writing historical fiction in a world where political correctness often means staying silent can be challenging. I work to remain faithful to the day's vernacular and word usage in all of my books, even if that means using a term not currently in vogue. Hearing the character's voice through shortened words, halted speaking, use of slang, or incorrect grammar breathes life into them. Genesis chapter 1 verse 27 tells us, We are all created in the image of God. And Acts chapter 17 verse 26 tells us, God made from one man every nation of humankind to live on all the face of the earth. Please, dear reader, Know that my heart is to edify Christ in all things. Sincerely, 
Heidi Gray McGill. This has been A Bride for Harley, the Proxy Bride Series, Book 76, written by Heidi Gray McGill, narrated by Emma Fay. Copyright 2022 by Heidi Gray McGill Books, LLC. If you enjoyed this audiobook, please be sure to subscribe and hit the bell icon to be the first to know when Heidi has new content available.